Chapter Seven of A Woman's Life by Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Lisa Reichert. Chapter Seven. The young couple got into the habit of playing cards. Every day after lunch, Jeanne played several games of bezique with her husband, while he smoked his pipe and drank six or eight glasses of brandy. When they had finished playing, Jeanne went upstairs to her bedroom, and sitting by the window, worked at a petticoat flounce she was embroidering, while the wind and rain beat against the panes. When her eyes ached, she looked out at the foaming, restless sea, gazed at it for a few minutes, and then took up her work again. She had nothing else to do, for Julien had taken the entire management of the house into his hands, that he might thoroughly satisfy his longing for authority and his mania for economy. He was exceedingly stingy. He never gave the servants anything beyond their exact wages, never allowed any food that was not strictly necessary. Every morning, ever since she had been at Les Peuples, the baker had made Jeanne a little Normandy cake, but Julien cut off this expense, and Jeanne had to content herself with toast. Wishing to avoid all arguments and quarrels, she never made any remark, but each fresh proof of her husband's avarice hurt her like the prick of a needle. It seemed so petty, so odious to her, brought up as she had been in a family where money was never thought of any importance. How often she had heard her mother say, "'Money is made to be spent.' But now Julien kept saying to her, "'Will you never be cured of throwing money away?' Whenever he could manage to reduce a salary or a bill by a few pence, he would slip the money into his pocket, saying with a pleased smile, "'Little streams make big rivers.' Jeanne would sometimes find herself dreaming, as she used to do before she was married. She would gradually stop working, and with her hands lying idle in her lap and her eyes fixed on space, she built castles in the air as if she were a young girl again. But the voice of Julien, giving an order to old Simon, would call her back to the realities of life, and she would take up her work, thinking, Ah, that is all over and done with now and a tear would fall on her fingers as they pushed the needle through the stuff. Rosalie, who used to be so gay and lively, always singing snatches of songs as she went about her work, gradually changed also. Her plump brown cheeks had fallen in and lost their brightened colour, and her skin was muddy and dark. Jeanne often asked her if she were ill, but the little maid always answered with a faint blush, No, madame, and got away as quickly as she could. Instead of tripping along as she had always done, she now dragged herself painfully from room to room, and seemed not even to care how she looked, for the peddlers in vain spread out their ribbons and corsets and bottles of scent before her. She never bought anything from them now. At the end of January the heavy clouds came across the sea from the north, and there was a heavy fall of snow. In one night the whole plain was whitened and in the morning the trees looked as if a mantle of frozen foam had been cast over them. Julien put on his high boots and passed his time in the ditch between the wood and the plain, watching for the migrating birds. Every now and then his shots would break the frozen silence of the fields, and hordes of black crows flew from the trees in terror. Jeanne, tired of staying indoors, would go out on the steps of the house, where, in the stillness of this snow-covered world, she could hear the bustle of the farms, or the faraway murmur of the waves, and the soft continual rustle of the falling snow. On one of these cold white mornings she was sitting by her bedroom fire, while Rosalie, who looked worse and worse every day, was slowly making the bed. All at once Jeanne heard a sigh of pain behind her. Without turning her head she asked, "'What is the matter with you, Rosalie?' The maid answered as she always did, nothing madame but her voice seemed to die away as she spoke jeanne had left off thinking about her when she suddenly noticed that she could not hear the girl moving she called rosalie there was no answer then she thought that the maid must have gone quietly out of the room without her hearing her and she cried in a louder tone rosalie again she received no answer and she was just stretching out her hand to ring the bell when she heard a low moan close beside her she started up in terror. Rosalie was sitting on the floor with her back against the bed, her legs stretched stiffly out, her face livid, and her eyes staring straight before her. 
Jeanne rushed to her side. "'Oh, Rosalie, what is the matter? What is it?' she asked in a fright. The maid did not answer a word, but fixed her wild eyes on her mistress, and gasped for breath, as if tortured by some excruciating pain. Then, stiffening every muscle in her body, and stifling a cry of anguish between her clenched teeth, she slipped down on her back, and all at once something stirred underneath her dress, which clung tightly round her legs. Jeanne heard a strange, gushing noise, something like the death-rattle of someone who is suffocating, and then came a long, low wail of pain. It was the first cry of suffering of a child entering the world. The sound came as a revelation to her, and suddenly losing her head, she rushed to the top of the stairs, crying, "'Julien! Julien!' "'What do you want?' he answered from below. She gasped out, "'It's Rosalie who—who—' who? But before she could say any more, Julien was running up the stairs two at a time. He dashed into the bedroom, raised the girl's clothes, and there lay a creased, shriveled, hideous little atom of humanity, feebly whining and trying to move its limbs. He got up with an evil look on his face, and pushed his distracted wife out of the room, saying, this is no place for you. Go away and send me Ludivine and old Simon. Jeanne went down to the kitchen, trembling all over, to deliver her husband's message. And then, afraid to go upstairs again, she went into the drawing-room, where a fire was never lighted, now her parents were away. Soon she saw Simon run out of the house, and come back five minutes after with Widow Dentu, the village midwife. Next she heard a noise on the stairs, which sounded as if they were carrying a body. Then Julien came to tell her that she could go back to her room. She went upstairs and sat down again before her bedroom fire, trembling as if she had just witnessed some terrible accident. "'How is she?' she asked. Julien, apparently in a great rage, was walking about the room in a preoccupied, nervous way. He did not answer his wife for some moments but at last he asked, stopping in his walk, "'Well, what do you mean to do with this girl?' Jeanne looked at her husband as if she did not understand his question. "'What do you mean?' she said. "'I don't know. How should I?' "'Well, anyway, we can't keep that child in the house,' he cried angrily. Jeanne looked very perplexed, and sat in silence for some time. At last she said, "'But, my dear, we could put it out to nurse somewhere?' He hardly let her finish her sentence. "'And who'll pay for it, will you?' "'But surely the father will take care of it,' she said, after another long silence. "'And if he marries Rosalie, everything will be all right.' "'The father,' answered Julian roughly. "'The father! Do you know who is the father? Of course you don't. Very well, then.' Jeanne began to get troubled. "'But he certainly will not forsake the girl. It would be such a cowardly thing to do.' We will ask her his name, and go and see him, and force him to give some account of himself. Julien had become calmer, and was again walking about the room. My dear girl, he replied, I don't believe she will tell you the man's name, or me either. Besides, suppose he wouldn't marry her. You must see that we can't keep a girl and her illegitimate child in our house. But Jeanne would only repeat doggedly, Then the man must be a villain but we will find out who he is, and then he will have us to deal with instead of that poor girl. Julien got very red. But until we know who he is? he asked. She did not know what to propose, so she asked Julien what he thought was the best thing to do. He gave his opinion very promptly. Oh, I should give her some money, and let her and her brat go to the devil. That made Jeanne very indignant. That shall never be done, she declared. Rosalie is my foster sister, and we have grown up together. She has erred, it is true, but I will never turn her out of doors for that, and if there is no other way out of the difficulty, I will bring up the child myself. And we should have a nice reputation, shouldn't we, with our name and connections? burst out Julien. People would say that we encouraged vice and sheltered prostitutes, and respectable people would never come near us. Why, what can you be thinking of? You must be mad. I will never have Rosalie turned out, she repeated quietly. If you will not keep her here, my mother will take her back again. But we are sure to find out the name of the father. 
At that he went out of the room, too angry to talk to her any more, and as he banged the door after him he cried, "'Women are fools with their absurd notions!' In the afternoon Jeanne went to see the invalid. She was lying in bed, wide awake, and the widow Dentu was rocking the child in her arms. As soon as she saw her mistress, Rosalie began to sob violently, and when Jeanne wanted to kiss her, she turned away and hid her face under the bedclothes. The nurse interfered and drew down the sheet, and then Rosalie made no further resistance, though the tears still ran down her cheeks. The room was very cold, for there was only a small fire in the grate, and the child was crying. Jeanne did not dare make any reference to the little one, for fear of causing another burst of tears. But she held Rosalie's hand, and kept repeating, mechanically, "'It won't matter. It won't matter.' The poor girl glanced shyly at the nurse from time to time. The child's cries seemed to pierce her heart, and sobs still escaped from her occasionally, though she forced herself to swallow her tears. Jeanne kissed her again and whispered in her ear, "'We'll take good care of it, you may be sure of that,' and then ran quickly out of the room, for Rosalie's tears were beginning to flow again. After that Jeanne went up every day to see the invalid, and every day Rosalie burst into tears when her mistress came into the room. The child was put out to nurse, and Julien would hardly speak to his wife, for he could not forgive her for refusing to dismiss the maid. One day he returned to the subject, but Jeanne drew out a letter from her mother in which the baroness said that if they would not keep Rosalie at Les Peuples, she was to be sent on to Rouen directly. "'Your mother's as great a fool as you are,' cried Julien but he did not say anything more about sending Rosalie away, and a fortnight later the maid was able to get up and perform her duties again. One morning Jeanne made her sit down, and holding both her hands in hers, "'Now then, Rosalie, tell me all about it,' she said, looking her straight in the face. Rosalie began to tremble. "'All about what, madame?' she said timidly. "'Who is the father of your child?' asked Jeanne. A look of despair came over the maid's face, and she struggled to disengage her hands from her mistress's grasp. But Jeanne kissed her, in spite of her struggles, and tried to console her. "'It is true you have been weak,' she said, "'but you are not the first to whom such a misfortune has happened, and if only the father of the child marries you, no one will think anything more about it. We would employ him, and he could live here with you.' Rosalie moaned as if she were being tortured, and tried to get her hands free that she might run away. "'I can quite understand how ashamed you feel,' went on Jeanne. "'But you see that I am not angry, and that I speak kindly to you. "'I wish to know this man's name for your own good, "'for I fear from your grief that he means to abandon you, "'and I want to prevent that. "'Julien will see him, and we will make him marry you, "'and we shall employ you both. "'We will see that he makes you happy.' "'This time Rosalie made so vigorous an effort that she succeeded in wrenching her hands away from her mistress, and she rushed from the room as if she were mad. "'I have tried to make Rosalie tell me her seducer's name,' said Jeanne to her husband at dinner that evening, "'but I did not succeed in doing so. Try and see if she will tell you that we may force the wretch to marry her.' "'There, don't let me hear any more about all that,' he said angrily. "'You wanted to keep this girl, and you have done so, but don't bother me about her.' He seemed still more irritable since Rosalie's confinement than he had been before. He had got into the habit of shouting at his wife whenever he spoke to her, as if he were always angry, while she, on the contrary, spoke softly, and did everything to avoid a quarrel. But she often cried when she was alone in her room at night. In spite of his bad temper, Julien had resumed the marital duties he had so neglected since his wedding to her and it was seldom now that he let three nights pass without accompanying his wife to her room. Rosalie soon got quite well again, and with better health came better spirits, but she always seemed frightened and haunted by some strange dread. Jeanne tried twice more to make her name her seducer, but each time she ran away without saying anything. Julien suddenly became better-tempered, and his young wife began to cherish vague hopes, and to regain a little of her former gaiety. But she often felt very unwell, though she never said anything about it. For five weeks the crisp, shining snow had lain on the frozen ground. 
In the meantime there was not a cloud to be seen, and at night the sky was strewn with stars. Standing alone in their square courtyards, behind the great frosted trees, the farms seemed dead beneath their snowy shrouds. Neither men nor cattle could go out, and the only sign of life about the homesteads and cottages was the smoke that went straight up from the chimneys into the frosty air. The grass, the hedges, and the wall of elms seemed killed by the cold. From time to time the trees cracked, as if the fibres of their branches were separating beneath the bark, and sometimes a big branch would break off and fall to the ground, its sap frozen and dried up by the intense cold. Jeanne thought the severe weather was the cause of her ill health, and she longed for the warm spring breezes. Sometimes the very idea of food disgusted her, and she could eat nothing. At other times she vomited after every meal, unable to digest the little she did eat. She had violent palpitations of the heart, and she lived in a constant and intolerable state of nervous excitement. One evening, when the thermometer was sinking still lower, Julien shivered as he left the dinner table, for the dining room was never sufficiently heated, so careful was he over the wood, and rubbing his hands together, "'It's too cold to sleep alone tonight, isn't it, darling?' he whispered to his wife, with one of his old, good-tempered laughs. Jeanne threw her arms round his neck, but she felt so ill, so nervous, and she had such aching pains that evening, that, with her lips close to his, she begged him to let her sleep alone. "'I feel so ill to-night,' she said, "'but I am sure to be better to-morrow.' "'Just as you please, my dear,' he answered. "'If you are ill, you must take care of yourself.' And he began to talk of something else. Jeanne went to bed early. Julien, for a wonder, ordered a fire to be lighted in his own room, and when the servant came to tell him that the fire had burnt up, he kissed his wife on the forehead and said good-night. The very walls seemed to feel the cold, and made little cracking noises as if they were shivering. Jeanne lay shaking with cold. Twice she got up to put more logs on the fire, and to pile her petticoats and dresses on the bed, but nothing seemed to make her any warmer. There were nervous twitchings in her legs which made her toss and turn restlessly from side to side. Her feet were numbed, her teeth chattered, her hands trembled, her heart beat so slowly that sometimes it seemed to stop altogether, and she gasped for breath, as if she could not draw the air into her lungs. As the cold crept higher and higher up her limbs, she was seized with a terrible fear. She had never felt like this before. Life seemed to be gradually slipping away from her, and she thought each breath she drew would be her last. "'I am going to die!' I am going to die, she thought, and in terror she jumped out of bed and rang for Rosalie. No one came. She rang again and again waited for an answer, shuddering and half frozen, but she waited in vain. Perhaps the maid was sleeping too heavily for the bell to arouse her, and almost beside herself with fear, Jeanne rushed out onto the landing without putting anything around her and with bare feet. She went noiselessly up the dark stairs, felt for Rosalie's door, opened it and called, Rosalie, then went into the room, stumbled against the bed, passed her hands over it, and found it empty and quite cold, as if no one had slept in it that night. Surely she cannot have gone out in such weather as this, she thought. Her heart began to beat so violently that it almost suffocated her, and she went downstairs to rouse Julian her legs giving way under her as she walked. She burst open her husband's door and hurried across the room, spurred on by the idea that she was going to die and the fear that she would become unconscious before she could see him again. Suddenly she stopped with a shriek, for by the light of the dying fire she saw Rosalie's head on the pillow beside her husband's. At her cry they both started up, but she had already recovered from the first shock of her discovery and fled to her room, while Julien called after her, Jeanne, Jeanne. She felt she could not see him or listen to his excuses and his lies, and again rushing out of her room, she ran downstairs. The staircase was in total darkness, but filled with the desire of flight, of getting away without seeing or hearing any more, 
she never stayed to think that she might fall and break her limbs on the stone stairs on the last step she sat down unable to think unable to reason her head in a whirl julien jumped out of bed and was hastily dressing himself she heard him moving about and she started up to escape from him he came downstairs crying jeanne listen to me jeanne do listen to me no she would not listen he should not degrade her by his touch she dashed into the dining-room as if a murderer were pursuing her looked round for a hiding-place or some dark corner where she might conceal herself and then crouched down under the table the door opened, and Julien came in with a light in his hand, still calling, Jeanne! Jeanne! She started off again like a hunted hare, tore into the kitchen, round which she ran twice like some wild animal at bay. Then, as he was getting nearer and nearer to her, she suddenly flung open the garden door and rushed out into the night. Her bare legs sank into the snow up to her knees, and this icy contact gave her new strength. Although she had nothing on but her chemise, she did not feel the bitter cold. Her mental anguish was too great for the consciousness of any mere bodily pain to reach her brain, and she ran on and on, looking as white as the snow-covered earth. She did not stop once to take breath, but rushed on across wood and plain without knowing or thinking of what she was doing. Suddenly she found herself at the edge of the cliff she instinctively stopped short and then crouched down in the snow and lay there with her mind as powerless to think as her body to move all at once she began to tremble as does a sail when caught by the wind her arms her hands her feet shook and twitched convulsively and consciousness returned to her things that had happened a long time before came back to her memory the sail in lestique's boat with him their conversation the dawn of their love the christening of the boat then her thoughts went still farther back till they reached the night of her arrival from the convent the night she had spent in happy dreams and now now her life was ruined she had had all her pleasure there were no joys no happiness in store for her and she could see the terrible future with all its tortures its deceptions and despair Surely it would be better to die now, at once. She heard a voice in the distance, crying, This way, this way, here are her footmarks. It was Julien looking for her. Oh, she could not, she would not see him again, never again. From the abyss before her came the faint sound of the waves as they broke on the rocks. She stood up to throw herself over the cliff, and in a despairing farewell to life, she moaned out that last cry of the dying the word that the soldier gasps out as he lies wounded to death on the battlefield mother then the thought of how her mother would sob when she heard of her daughter's death and how her father would kneel in agony beside her mangled corpse flashed across her mind and in that one second she realized all the bitterness of their grief she fell feebly back on the snow, and Julien and old Simon came up, with Marius behind them, holding a lantern. They drew her back before they dared attempt to raise her, so near the edge of the cliff was she, and they did with her what they liked, for she could not move a muscle. She knew that they carried her indoors, that she was put to bed, and rubbed with hot flannels, and then she was conscious of nothing more. A nightmare, but was it a nightmare, haunted her. She thought she was in bed in her own room. It was broad daylight, but she could not get up, though she did not know why she could not. She heard a noise on the boards, a scratching, rustling noise, and all at once a little grey mouse ran over the sheet. Then another one appeared, and another which came running towards her chest. Jeanne was not frightened. She wanted to take hold of the little animal and put out her hand towards it, but she could not catch it. Then came more mice. Ten, twenty, hundreds, thousands sprang up on all sides. They ran up the bedposts and along the tapestry, and covered the whole bed. They got under the clothes, and Jeanne could feel them gliding over her skin, tickling her legs, running up and down her body. 
she could see them coming from the foot of the bed to get inside and creep close to her breast. But when she struggled and stretched out her hands to catch one, she always clutched the air. Then she got angry and cried out and wanted to run away. She fancied someone held her down, and that strong arms were thrown around her to prevent her moving. But she could not see anyone. She had no idea of the time that all this lasted. She only knew that it seemed a very long while. At last she became conscious again, conscious that she was tired and aching, and yet better than she had been. She felt very, very weak. She looked round and did not feel at all surprised to see her mother sitting by her bedside, with a stout man whom she did not know. She had forgotten how old she was, and thought she was a little child again, for her memory was entirely gone. "'See, she is conscious,' said the stout man. The baroness began to cry, and the big man said, "'Come, come, Madame le Baron, I assure you there is no longer any danger. But you must not talk to her, just let her sleep.' It seemed to Jeanne that she lay for a long time in a doze, which became a heavy sleep if she tried to think of anything. She had a vague idea that the past contained something dreadful, and she was content to lie still without trying to recall anything to her memory. But one day, when she opened her eyes, she saw Julien standing beside the bed, and the curtain which hid everything from her was suddenly drawn aside, and she remembered what had happened. She threw back the clothes and sprang out of bed to escape from her husband, but as soon as her feet touched the floor she fell to the ground, for she was too weak to stand. Julien hastened to her assistance, but when he attempted to raise her, she shrieked and rolled from side to side to avoid the contact of his hands. The door opened, and Aunt Lisson and Widow Dentu hurried in, closely followed by the Baron and his wife, the latter gasping for breath. They put Jeanne to bed again, and she closed her eyes and pretended to be asleep, that she might think undisturbed. Her mother and aunt busied themselves around her, saying from time to time, "'Do you know us, Jeanne, dear?' She pretended not to hear them, and made no answer, and in the evening they went away, leaving her to the care of the nurse." She could not sleep all that night, for she was painfully trying to connect the incidents she could remember, one with the other. But there seemed to be gaps in her memory which she could not bridge over. Little by little, however, all the facts came back to her, and then she tried to decide what she had better do. She must have been very ill, or her mother and Aunt Lisson and the Baron would not have been sent for. But what had Julien said? Did her parents know everything? And where was Rosalie? The only thing she could do was to go back to Rouen with her father and mother. They could all live there together as they used to do, and it would be just the same as if she had not been married. The next day she noticed and listened to all that went on around her, but she did not let anyone see that she understood everything and had recovered her full senses. Towards evening, when no one but the baroness was in her room, Jeanne whispered softly, "'Mother, dear!' She was surprised to hear how changed her own voice was. But the baroness took her hands, exclaiming, "'My child, my dear little Jeanne, do you know me, my pet?' "'Yes, mother, but you mustn't cry. I want to talk to you seriously. Did Julien tell you why I ran out into the snow?' "'Yes, my darling. You have had a very dangerous fever.' "'That was not the reason, mamma. I had the fever afterwards.' Hasn't he told you why I tried to run away, and what was the cause of the fever? No, dear. It was because I found Rosalie in his bed. The baroness thought she was still delirious and tried to soothe her. There, there, my darling, lie down and try to go to sleep. But Jeanne would not be quieted. I am not talking nonsense now, mamma, dear, though I dare say I have been lately, she said. I felt very ill one night, and I got up and went to Julien's room. There I saw Rosalie lying beside him. My grief nearly drove me mad, and I ran out into the snow, meaning to throw myself over the cliff. "'Yes, darling, you have been ill, very ill indeed,' answered the baroness. "'It wasn't that, mamma. I found Rosalie in Julien's bed, and I will not stay with him any longer. 
You shall take me back to Rouen with you. The doctor had told the baroness to let Jeanne have her own way in everything, so she answered, Very well, my pet. Jeanne began to lose patience. I see you don't believe me, she said pettishly. Go and find papa. Perhaps he'll manage to understand that I am speaking the truth. The baroness rose slowly to her feet, dragged herself out of the room with the aid of two sticks, and came back in a few minutes with the baron. They sat down by the bedside, and Jeanne began to speak in her weak voice. She spoke quite coherently, and she told them all about Julien's ways, his harshness, his avarice, and, lastly, his infidelity. The baron could see that her mind was not wandering, but he hardly knew what to say or think. He affectionately took her hand like he used to do when she was a child, and he told her fairy tales to send her to sleep. "'Listen, my dear,' he said, "'we must not do anything rashly. Don't let us say anything till we have thought it well over. Will you promise me to try and bear with your husband until we have decided what is best to be done?' "'Very well,' she answered, "'but I will not stay here after I get well.' Then she added in a whisper, "'Where is Rosalie now?' "'You shall not see her any more,' replied the baron. But she persisted. "'Where is she? I want to know.' He owned that she was still in the house, but he declared she should go at once. Directly he left Jeanne's room, his heart full of pity for his child and indignation against her husband, the baron went to find Julien and said to him sternly, "'Monsieur, I have come to ask for an explanation of your behaviour to my daughter. You have not only been false to her, but you have deceived her with your servant, which makes your conduct doubly infamous.' Julien swore he was innocent of such a thing, and called heaven to witness his denial. What proof was there? Jeanne was just recovering from brain fever, and of course her thoughts were still confused.' She had rushed out in the snow one night at the beginning of her illness, in a fit of delirium, and how could her statement be believed, when, on the very night that she said she had surprised her maid in her husband's bed, she was dashing over the house nearly naked and quite unconscious of what she was doing. Julien got very angry, and threatened the baron with an action if he did not withdraw his accusation, and the baron, confused by this indignant denial, began to make excuses and to beg his son-in-law's pardon, but Julien refused to take his outstretched hand. Jeanne did not seem vexed when she heard what her husband had said. "'He is telling a lie, papa,' she said quietly, "'but we will force him to own the truth.' For two days she lay silent, turning over all sorts of things in her mind. On the third morning she asked for Rosalie. The baron refused to let the maid go up, and told Jeanne that she had left. But Jeanne insisted on seeing her, and said, "'Send someone to fetch her, then.' When the doctor came she was very excited, because they would not let her see the maid, and they told him what was the matter. Jeanne burst into tears and almost shrieked, "'I will see her! I will see her!' The doctor took her hand and said in a low voice, "'Calm yourself, madame.' Any violent emotion might have very serious results just now, for you are enceinte. Jeanne's tears ceased directly. Even as the doctor spoke, she fancied she could feel a movement within her, and she lay still, paying no attention to what was being said or done around her. She could not sleep that night. It seemed so strange to think that within her was another life, and she felt sorry because it was Julien's child and full of fears in case it should resemble its father. The next morning she sent for the baron. "'Papa, dear,' she said, "'I have made up my mind to know the whole truth, especially now. You hear, and you know you must let me do as I like because of my condition. Now listen. Go and fetch Monsieur le Curé. He must be here to make Rosalie tell the truth. Then, as soon as he is here, you must send her up to me.' and you and mamma must come too, but whatever you do, don't let Julien know what is going on. The priest came about an hour afterwards. He was fatter than ever, and panted quite as much as the baroness. He sat down in an armchair and began joking, while he wiped his forehead with his checked handkerchief from sheer habit. 
"'Well, Madame la Baronne, I don't think we are either of us getting thinner. In my opinion we make a very handsome pair.' Then, turning to the invalid, he said, "'Ah, ah, my young lady, I hear we'll soon have a christening, and that it won't be the christening of a boat either this time. Ha, ha, ha!' Then he went on in a grave voice, "'It will be one more defender for the country,' or, after a short silence, "'another good wife and mother like you, madame,' with a bow to the baroness. The door flew open, and there stood Rosalie, crying, struggling, and refusing to move, while the baron tried to push her in. At last he gave her a sudden shake, and threw her into the room with a jerk, and she stood in the middle of the floor with her face in her hands, sobbing violently. Jeanne started up as white as a sheet, and her heart could be seen beating under her thin nightdress. It was some time before she could speak, but at last she gasped out, "'There, there is no need for me to question you. Your confusion in my presence is, is quite sufficient proof of your guilt.' She stopped for a few moments for want of breath, and then went on again, "'But I wish to know all. You see that Monsieur le Curé is here, so you understand you will have to answer as if you were at confession.' Rosalie had not moved from where the baron had pushed her. She made no answer, but her sobs became almost shrieks. The baron, losing all patience with her, seized her hands, drew them roughly from her face, and threw her on her knees beside the bed, saying, "'Why don't you say something? Answer your mistress!' She crouched down on the ground, in the position in which Mary Magdalene is generally depicted. Her cap was on one side, her apron on the floor and as soon as her hands were free, she again buried her face in them. "'Come, come, my girl,' said the curé. "'We don't want to do you any harm, but we must know exactly what has happened. Now listen to what is asked you, and answer truthfully.' Jeanne was leaning over the side of the bed, looking at the girl. "'Is it not true that I found you in Julien's bed?' she asked. "'Yes, madame,' moaned out Rosalie through her fingers. At that the baroness burst into tears also, and the sound of her sobs mingled with the maid's. "'How long had that gone on?' asked Jeanne, her eyes fixed on the maid. "'Ever since he came here,' stammered Rosalie. "'Since he came here,' repeated Jeanne, hardly understanding what the words meant. "'Do you mean since—since since the spring?' "'Yes, madame.' "'Since he first came to the house?' "'Yes, madame. But how did it happen? How did he come to say anything to you about it?' burst out Jeanne, as if she could keep back the questions no longer. "'Did he force you? Or did you give yourself to him? How could you do such a thing?' "'I don't know,' answered Rosalie, taking her hands from her face, and speaking as if the words were forced from her, by an irresistible desire to talk and to tell all. The day he dined here for the first time, he came up to my room. He had hidden in the garret, and I durstn't cry out for fear of what every one would say. He got into my bed, and I don't know how it was or what I did, but he did just as he liked with me. I never said nothing about it, because I thought he was nice. "'But your—your child—is it his?' cried Jeanne. "'Yes, madame,' answered Rosalie between her sobs. Then neither said anything more, and the silence was only broken— by the baroness's and Rosalie's sobs. The tears rose to Jeanne's eyes, and flowed noiselessly down her cheeks. So her maid's child had the same father as her own. All her anger had evaporated, and in its place was a dull, gloomy, deep despair. After a short silence, she said in a softer, tearful voice, "'After we returned from—from from our wedding tour, when did he begin again?' The, the night you came back, answered the maid, who was now almost lying on the floor. Each word wrung Jeanne's heart. He had actually left her for this girl the very night of their return to Les Peuples. That then was why he had let her sleep alone. She had heard enough now. She did not want to know anything more, and she cried to the girl, Go away, go away. As Rosalie, overcome by her emotion, did not move, she called to her father, "'Take her away! Carry her out of the room!' But the curé, who had said nothing up to now, 
thought the time had come for a little discourse. "'You have behaved very wickedly,' he said to Rosalie. "'Very wickedly, indeed, and the good God will not easily forgive you. Think of the punishment which awaits you if you do not live a better life henceforth. Now you are young is the time to train yourself in good ways. No doubt Madame la Baronne will do something for you, and we shall be able to find you a husband.' He would have gone on like this for a long time, had not the baron seized Rosalie by the shoulders, dragged her to the door, and thrown her into the passage like a bundle of clothes. When he came back, looking whiter even than his daughter, the curé began again, "'Well, you know, all the girls round here are the same. It is a very bad state of things, but it can't be helped, and we must make a little allowance for the weakness of human nature. They never marry until they are enceinte. "'Never, madame. One might almost call it a local custom,' he added with a smile. Then he went on indignantly. "'Even the children are the same. Only last year I found a little boy and girl from my class in the cemetery together. I told their parents, and what do you think they replied? "'Well, monsieur le curé, we didn't teach it them. We can't help it. "'So you see, monsieur, your maid has only done like the others.' "'The maid!' interrupted the baron, trembling with excitement. "'The maid! What do I care about her? It's Julien's conduct which I think so abominable, and I shall certainly take my daughter away with me.' He walked up and down the room, getting more and more angry with every step he took. "'It is infamous the way he has deceived my daughter. Infamous! He's a wretch, a villain, and I will tell him so to his face.' I'll horsewhip him within an inch of his life. The curé was slowly enjoying a pinch of snuff as he sat beside the baroness, and thinking how he could make peace. Come now, monsieur le baron, between ourselves, he has only done like everyone else. I am quite sure you don't know many husbands who are faithful to their wives, do you now? And he added in a sly, good-natured way, I bet you yourself have played your little games. You can't say conscientiously that you haven't, I know. Why, of course you have. And who knows but what you have made the acquaintance of some little maid just like Rosalie. I tell you every man is the same. And your escapades didn't make your wife unhappy, or lessen your affection for her, did they? The baron stood still in confusion. It was true that he had done the same himself, and not only once or twice, but as often as he had got the chance. His wife's presence in the house had never made any difference when the servants were pretty. And was he a villain because of that? Then why should he judge Julien's conduct so severely, when he had never thought that any fault could be found with his own? Though her tears were hardly dried, the idea of her husband's pranks brought a slight smile to the baroness's lip, for she was one of those good-natured, tender-hearted, sentimental women to whom love adventures are an essential part of existence. Jeanne lay back exhausted, thinking, with open, unseeing eyes, of all this painful episode. The expression that had wounded her most in Rosalie's confession was, I never said anything about it because I thought he was nice. She, his wife, had also thought him nice, and that was the sole reason why she had united herself to him for life had given up every other hope, every other project, to join her destiny to his. She had plunged into marriage, into this pit from which there was no escape, into all this misery, this grief, this despair, simply because, like Rosalie, she had thought him nice. The door was flung violently open, and Julien came in, looking perfectly wild with rage. He had seen Rosalie moaning on the landing, and, guessing that she had been forced to speak, he had come to see what was going on. But at the sight of the priest he was taken thoroughly aback. "'What is this? What is the matter?' he asked, in a voice which trembled in spite of his efforts to make it sound calm. The baron, who had been so violent just before, dared say nothing after the curé's argument, in case his son-in-law should quote his own example." The baroness only wept more bitterly than before, and Jeanne raised herself on her hands and looked steadily at this man who was causing her so much sorrow. Her breath came and went quickly, but she managed to answer, "'The matter is 
that we know all about your shameful conduct ever since ever since the day you first came here we know that that rosalie's rosalie's child is yours like like mine and that they will be brothers her grief became so poignant at this thought that she hid herself under the bedclothes and sobbed bitterly julien stood open-mouthed not knowing what to say or do the cure again interposed come come my dear young lady he said you mustn't give way like that see now be reasonable he rose went to the bedside and laid his cool hand on this despairing woman's forehead his simple touch seemed to soothe her wonderfully she felt calmer at once as if the large hand of this country priest accustomed to gestures of absolution and sympathy had borne with it some strange peace-giving power madame we must always forgive said the good-natured priest you are borne down by a great grief but god in his mercy has also sent you a great joy since he has permitted you to have hopes of becoming a mother this child will console you for all your trouble and it is in its name that i implore that i adjure you to forgive monsieur julien it will be a fresh tie between you a pledge of your husband's future fidelity can you still your heart against the father of your unborn child too weak to feel either anger or resentment and only conscious of a crushed aching exhausted sensation she made no answer her nerves were thoroughly unstrung and she clung to life but by a very slender thread the baroness to whom resentment seemed utterly impossible and whose mind was simply incapable of bearing any prolonged strain said in a low tone come jeanne the cure drew julien close to the bed and placed his hand in his wife's giving it a little tap as if to make the union more complete then dropping his professional pulpit tone he said with a satisfied air there that's done believe me it is better so the two hands united thus for an instant loosed their clasp directly julien not daring to embrace jeanne kissed his mother-in-law then turned on his heel took the baron who in his heart was not sorry that everything had finished so quietly by the arm and drew him from the room to go and smoke a cigar then the tired invalid went to sleep and the baroness and the priest began to chat in low tones the abbe talked of what had just occurred and proceeded to explain his ideas on the subject while the baroness assented to everything he said with a nod very well then it's understood he said in conclusion you give the girl the farm at barville and i will undertake to find her a good honest husband oh you may be sure that with twenty thousand francs we shall not want candidates for her hand we shall have an embarrass de choix the baroness was smiling happily now though two tears still lingered on her cheeks barville is worth twenty thousand francs at the very least she said and you understand that it is to be settled on the child though the parents will have it as long as they live then the cure shook hands with the baroness and rose to go don't get up madame la baronne don't get up he exclaimed i know the value of a step too well myself as he went out he met aunt lison coming to see her patient she did not notice that anything extraordinary had happened no one had told her anything and as usual she had not the slightest idea of what was going on end of chapter seven chapter eight of a woman's life by guy de maupassant this librivox recording is in the public domain read by lisa reichert chapter eight rosalie had left the house and the time of jeanne's confinement was drawing near the sorrow she had gone through had taken away all pleasure from the thought of becoming a mother and she waited for the child's birth without any impatience or curiosity her mind entirely filled with her presentiment of coming evils spring was close at hand the bare trees still trembled in the cold wind but in the damp ditches the yellow primroses were already blossoming among the decaying autumn leaves 
the rain-soaked fields the farmyards and the commons exhaled a damp odour as of fermenting liquor and little green leaves peeped out of the brown earth and glistened in the sun a big strongly built woman had been engaged in rosalie's place and she now supported the baroness in her dreary walks along the avenue where the track made by her foot was always damp and muddy jeanne low-spirited and in constant pain leant on her father's arm when she went out while on her other side walked aunt lison holding her niece's hand and thinking nervously of this mysterious suffering that she would never know they would all three walk for hours without speaking a word and while they were out julien went all over the country on horseback for he had suddenly become very fond of riding the baron his wife and the vicomte paid a visit to the fourvilles whom julien seemed to know very well though no one at the chateau knew exactly how the acquaintance had begun and another duty call was paid to the brisevilles and those two visits were the only break in their dull monotonous life one afternoon about four o'clock two people on horseback trotted up to the chateau julien rushed into his wife's room in great excitement make haste and go down he exclaimed here are the fourvilles they have come simply to make a neighbourly call as they know the condition you are in say i am out but that i shall be in soon i am just going to change my coat jeanne went downstairs and found in the drawing-room a gigantic man with big red moustaches and a pale pretty woman with a sad-looking face sentimental eyes and hair of a dead gold that looked as if the sun had never caressed it when the fair-haired woman had introduced the big man as her husband she said monsieur de lamare whom we have met several times has told us how unwell you are so we thought we would not put off coming to see you any longer you see we have come on horseback so you must look upon this simply as a neighbourly call besides i have already had the pleasure of receiving a visit from your mother and the baron she spoke easily in a refined familiar way and jeanne fell in love with her at once in her i might indeed find a friend she thought the comte de fourville unlike his wife seemed as much out of place in a drawing-room as a bull in a china shop when he sat down he put his hat on a chair close by him and then the problem of what he should do with his hands presented itself to him first he rested them on his knees then on the arms of his chair and finally joined them as if in prayer julien came in so changed in appearance that jeanne stared at him in mute surprise he had shaved himself and looked as handsome and charming as when he was wooing her his hair just now so coarse and dull had been brushed and sprinkled with perfumed oil till it had recovered its soft shining waves and his large eyes which seemed made to express nothing but love had their old winning look in them he made himself as amiable and fascinating as he had been before his marriage he pressed the hairy paw of the comte who seemed much relieved by his presence and kissed the hand of the comtesse whose ivory cheek became just tinged with pink when the fourvilles were going away the comtesse said will you come for a ride on thursday vicomte and as julien bowed and replied i shall be very pleased madame she turned and took jeanne's hand saying to her affectionately when you are well again we must all three go for long rides together we could make such delightful excursions if you would then she gracefully caught up the skirt of her riding habit and sprang into the saddle as lightly as a bird and her husband after awkwardly raising his hat leapt on his huge horse feeling and looking at his ease as soon as he was mounted what charming people cried julien as soon as they were out of sight we may indeed think ourselves lucky to have made their acquaintance the little comtesse is delightful answered jeanne feeling pleased herself though she hardly knew why i am sure i shall like her but the husband seems a bear how did you get to know them i met them one day at the brisevilles he replied rubbing his hands together cheerfully the husband certainly is a little rough but he is a true gentleman he is passionately fond of shooting nothing else happened until the end of july 
Then one Tuesday evening, as they were all sitting under the plane tree beside a little table, on which stood two liqueur glasses and a decanter of brandy, Jeanne suddenly turned very white and put both her hands to her sides with a cry. A sharp pain had shot through her and at once died away. In about ten minutes came another one, hardly so severe but of longer duration than the first. Her father and husband almost carried her indoors, for the short distance between the plane tree and her room seemed miles to her. She could not stifle her moans, and, overpowered by an intolerable sense of heaviness and weight, she implored them to let her sit down and rest. The child was not expected until September, but, in case of accident, a horse was harnessed and old Simon galloped off for the doctor. He came about midnight and at once recognized the signs of a premature confinement. The actual pain had a little diminished, but Jeanne felt an awful deathly faintness, and she thought she was going to die, for death is sometimes so close that his icy breath can almost be felt. The room was full of people. The baroness lay back in an armchair, gasping for breath. The baron ran hither and thither, bringing all manner of things, and completely losing his head. Julien walked up and down, looking very troubled, but really feeling quite calm. And the widow Dentu, whom nothing could surprise or startle, stood at the foot of the bed with an expression suited to the occasion on her face. Nurse, midwife, and watcher of the dead, equally ready to welcome the newborn infant, to receive its first cry, to immerse it in its first bath and to wrap it in its first covering, or to hear the last word, the last death-rattle, the last moan of the dying, to clothe them in their last garment, to sponge their wasted bodies, to draw the sheet about their still faces, the widow Dentu had become utterly indifferent to any of the chances accompanying a birth or a death. Every now and then Jeanne gave a low moan, for two hours it seemed as if the child would not be born yet after all. But about daybreak the pains recommenced, and soon became almost intolerable. As the involuntary cries of anguish burst through her clenched teeth, Jeanne thought of Rosalie, who had hardly even moaned, and whose bastard child had been born without any of the torture, such as she was suffering. In her wretched, troubled mind she drew comparisons between her maid and herself, and she cursed God whom, until now, she had believed just. She thought, in angry astonishment, of how fate favours the wicked, and of the unpardonable lies of those who hold forth inducements to be upright and good. Sometimes the agony was so great that she could think of nothing else, her suffering absorbing all her strength, her reason, her consciousness. In the intervals of relief her eyes were fixed on Julien, and then she was filled with a mental anguish as she thought of the day her maid had fallen at the foot of this very bed with her newborn child, the brother of the infant that was now causing her such terrible pain. She remembered perfectly every gesture, every look, every word of her husband as he stood beside the maid, and now she could see in his movements the same ennui, the same indifference for her suffering as he had felt for Rosalie's. It was the selfish carelessness of a man whom the idea of paternity irritates. She was seized by an excruciating pain, a spasm so agonizing that she thought, I am going to die, I am dying, and her soul was filled with a furious hatred. She felt she must curse this man who was the cause of all her agony, and this child which was killing her. She strained every muscle in a supreme effort to rid herself of this awful burden, and then it felt as if her whole inside was pouring away from her, and her suffering suddenly became less. The nurse and the doctor bent over her and took something away, and she heard the choking noise she had heard once before, and then the low cry of pain. The feeble whine of the newborn child filled her ears and seemed to enter her poor exhausted body till it reached her very soul, and in an unconscious movement she tried to hold out her arms. With the child was born a new joy, a fresh rapture. In one second she had been delivered from that terrible pain, and made happier than she had ever been before, 
and she revived in mind and body as she realized for the first time the pleasure of being a mother she wanted to see her child it had not any hair or nails for it had come before its time but when she saw this human larva move its limbs and open its mouth and when she touched its wrinkled little face her heart overflowed with happiness and she knew that she would never feel weary of life again for her love for the atom she held in her arms would be so absorbing that it would make her indifferent to everything else from that time her child was her chief her only care and she idolized it more perhaps because she had been so deceived in her love and disappointed in her hopes she insisted on having the cot close to her bed and when she could get up she sat by the window the whole day rocking the cradle with her foot she was even jealous of the wet nurse and when the hungry baby held out its arms and mouth towards the big blue-veined breast she felt as if she would like to tear her son from this strong quiet peasant woman's arms and strike and scratch the bosom to which he clung so eagerly she embroidered his fine robes herself putting into them the most elaborate work he was always surrounded by a cloud of lace and wore the handsomest caps the only thing she could talk about was the baby's clothes and she was always interrupting a conversation to hold up a band or bib or some especially pretty ribbon for admiration for she took no notice in what was being said around her as she turned and twisted some tiny garment about in her hands and held it up to the light to see better how it looked don't you think he will look lovely in that she was always asking and her mother and the baron smiled at this all-absorbing affection but julien would exclaim impatiently what a nuisance she is with that brat for his habits had been upset and his overweening importance diminished by the arrival of this noisy imperious tyrant and he was half jealous of the scrap of humanity who now held the first place in the house jeanne could hardly bear to be away from her baby for an instant and she even sat watching him all night through as he lay sleeping in his cradle these vigils and this continual anxiety began to tell upon her health the want of sleep weakened her and she grew thinner and thinner until at last the doctor ordered the child to be separated from her it was in vain that she employed tears commands and entreaties each night the baby slept with his nurse and each night his mother rose from her bed and went barefooted to put her ear to the keyhole and listen if he was sleeping quietly julien found her there one night as he was coming in late from dining at the fourvilles and after that she was locked into her room every evening to compel her to stay in bed the child was to be named pierre simon paul they were going to call him paul and at the end of august he was christened the baron being godfather and aunt lison godmother at the beginning of september aunt lison went away and her absence was as unnoticed as her presence had been one evening after dinner the cure called at the chateau there seemed an air of mystery about him and after a few commonplace remarks he asked the baron and baroness if he could speak to them in private for a few moments they all three walked slowly down the avenue talking eagerly as they went while julien feeling uneasy and irritated at this secrecy was left behind with jeanne he offered to accompany the priest when he went away and they walked off towards the church where the angelus was ringing it was a cool almost cold evening and the others soon went into the house they were all beginning to feel a little drowsy when the drawing-room door was suddenly thrown open and julien came in looking very vexed without stopping to see whether jeanne was there or not he cried to the baron as soon as he entered the room upon my soul you must be mad to go and give twenty thousand francs to that girl they were all taken too much by surprise to make any answer and he went on too angry to speak distinctly i can't understand how you can be such fools but there i suppose you will keep on till we haven't a sou left the baron recovering himself a little tried to check his son-in-law be quiet he exclaimed don't you see that your wife is in the room i don't care if she is answered julien stamping his foot besides she ought to know about it it is depriving her of her rightful inheritance jeanne had listened to her husband in amazement utterly at a loss to know what it was all about 
"'Whatever is the matter?' she asked. Then Julien turned to her, expecting her to side with him, as the loss of the money would affect her also. He told her in a few words how her parents were trying to arrange a marriage for Rosalie, and how the maid's child was to have the farm at Barville, which was worth twenty thousand francs at the very least. And he kept on repeating, "'Your parents must be mad, my dear, raving mad. Twenty thousand francs! Twenty thousand francs! They can't be in their right senses. Twenty thousand francs for a bastard!' Jeanne listened to him quite calmly, astonished herself to find that she felt neither anger nor sorrow at this meanness. But she was perfectly indifferent now to everything which did not concern her child. The baron was choking with anger, and at last he burst out with a stamp of the foot, "'Really, this is too much. Whose fault is it that this girl has to have a dowry? You seem to forget who is her child's father.' but no doubt you would abandon her altogether if you had your way. Julien gazed at the baron for a few moments in silent surprise. Then he went on more quietly. But fifteen hundred francs would have been ample to give her. All the peasant girls about here have children before they marry, so what does it matter who they have them by? And then, setting aside the injustice you will be doing Jeanne and me, you forget that if you give Rosalie a farm worth twenty thousand francs, everybody will see at once that there must be a reason for such a gift you should think a little of what is due to our name and position he spoke in a calm cool way as if he were sure of his logic and the strength of his argument the baron disconcerted by this fresh view of the matter could find nothing to say in reply and julien feeling his advantage added but fortunately nothing is settled i know the man who is going to marry her and he is an honest fellow with whom everything can yet be satisfactorily arranged. I will see to the matter myself. With that he went out of the room, wishing to avoid any further discussion, and taking the silence with which his words were received, to mean acquiescence. As soon as the door had closed after his son-in-law, the baron exclaimed, "'Oh, this is more than I can stand!' Jeanne, catching sight of her father's horrified expression, burst into a clear laugh, which rang out as it used to do whenever she had seen something very funny. "'Papa! Papa!' she cried. "'Did you hear the tone in which he said twenty thousand francs?' The baroness, whose smiles lay as near the surface as her tears, quivered with laughter as she saw Jeanne's gaiety, and thought of her son-in-law's furious face and his indignant exclamations, and determined attempt to prevent this money, which was not his, being given to the girl he had seduced. Finally the baron caught the contagion, and they all three laughed till they ached, as in the happy days of old. When they were a little calmer, Jeanne said, "'It is very funny, but really I don't seem to mind in the least what he says or does now. I look upon him quite as a stranger, and I can hardly believe I am his wife. You see, I am able to laugh at his—his his want of delicacy.' and the parents and child involuntarily kissed each other, with smiles on their lips, though the tears were not very far from their eyes. Two days after this scene, when Julien had gone out for a ride, a tall young fellow of about four or five-and-twenty, dressed in a brand-new blue blouse, which hung in stiff folds, climbed stealthily over the fence, as if he had been hiding there all morning, crept along the Cuillard's ditch, and went round to the other side of the chateau, where Jeanne and her father and mother were sitting under the plane tree. He took off his cap and awkwardly bowed as he came towards them, and when he was within speaking distance, mumbled, "'Your servant, Monsieur le Baron, Madame, and company.' Then, as no one said anything to him, he introduced himself as Désiré Lecoq. His name failing to explain his presence at the chateau, the Baron asked, "'What do you want?' The peasant was very disconcerted when he found he had to state his business. He hesitated, stammered, cast his eyes from the cap he held in his hands, to the chateau roof and back again, and at last began, "'Monsieur le curé has said something to me about this business.' Then, fearing to say too much and thus injure his own interests, he stopped short. "'What business?' asked the baron. "'I don't know what you mean.' "'About your maid. What's her name? Rosalie.' said the man in a low voice. Jeanne, guessing what he had come about, got up and went away with her child in her arms. 
"'Sit down,' said the baron, pointing to the chair his daughter had just left. The peasant took the seat with a thank you kindly, and then waited as if he had nothing whatever to say. After a few moments, during which no one spoke, he thought he had better say something, so he looked up to the blue sky and remarked, "'What fine weather for this time of year, to be sure. It'll help on the crops finely.' And then he again relapsed into silence. The baron began to get impatient. "'Then you are going to marry, Rosalie?' he said in a dry tone, going straight to the point. At that all the crafty, suspicious nature of the Normandy peasant was on the alert. "'That depends,' he answered quickly. "'Perhaps I am, and perhaps I ain't. That depends.' All this beating about the bush irritated the baron. "'Can't you give a straightforward answer?' he exclaimed. "'Have you come to say you will marry the girl, or not?' The man looked at his feet as though he expected to find advice there. "'If it's as Monsieur le Curé says,' he replied, "'I'll have her. But if it's as Monsieur le Julien says, I won't.' "'What did Monsieur Julien tell you?' "'Monsieur Julien told me how I should have fifteen hundred francs, but Monsieur le Curé told me as how I should have twenty thousand. I'll have her for twenty thousand, but I won't for fifteen hundred. The baroness was tickled by the perplexed look on the yokel's face, and began to shake with laughter as she sat in her armchair. Her gaiety surprised the peasant, who looked at her suspiciously out of the corner of his eye as he waited for an answer. The baron cut short all this haggling. "'I have told Monsieur le Curé that you shall have the farm at Barville, which is worth twenty thousand francs, for life, and then it is to become the child's. That is all I have to say on the matter, and I always keep my word. Now, is your answer yes or no? A satisfied smile broke over the man's face, and with a sudden loquacity, Oh, then I don't say no, he replied. That was the only thing that pulled me up. When Monsieur le Curé said something to me about it in the first place, I said yes at once, especially as it was to oblige Monsieur le Baron, who'd be sure to pay me back for it, as I says to myself. Ain't it always the way, and doesn't one good turn always deserve another? But Monsieur Julien comes up, and then it was only fifteen hundred francs. Then I says to myself, I must find out the rights of this, and so I came here. In course I believed your word, Monsieur le Baron, but I wanted to find out the rights of the case. Short reckonings make long friends, don't they, Monsieur le Baron? He would have gone on like this till dinner time if no one had interrupted him, so the Baron broke in with, when will you marry her? The question aroused the peasant's suspicions again directly. Couldn't I have it put down in writing first? he asked in a halting way. Why, bless my soul, isn't the marriage contract good enough for you? exclaimed the baron, angered by the man's suspicious nature. But until I get that, I should like it wrote down on paper, persisted the peasant. Having it down on paper never does no harm. "'Give a plain answer, now at once,' said the baron, rising to put an end to the interview. "'If you don't choose to marry the girl, say so. I know someone else who would be glad of the chance.' The idea of twenty thousand francs slipping from his hands into someone else's startled the peasant out of his cautiousness, and he at once decided to say yes. "'Agreed, Monsieur le Baron,' he said, holding out his hand as if he were concluding the purchase of a cow. It's done, and there's no going back from the bargain. The baron took his hand and cried to the cook, Ludovine, bring a bottle of wine. The wine was drunk, and then the peasant went away, feeling a great deal lighter-hearted than when he had come. Nothing was said about this visit to Julien. The drawing up of the marriage contract was kept a great secret. Then the bans were published, and Rosalie was married on the Monday morning. At the church, a neighbour stood behind the bride and bridegroom with a child in her arms as an omen of good luck, and everyone thought Desiree Lecoq very fortunate. "'He was born with a call,' said the peasants with a smile. When Julien heard of the marriage, he had a violent quarrel with the baron and baroness, and they decided to shorten their visit at Les Peuples. Jeanne was sorry, but she did not grieve as before when her parents went away for now all her hopes and thoughts were centred on her son. 
End of chapter 8「Nine, Part A of A Woman's Life by Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Lisa Reichert. Chapter Nine, Part A. Now Jeanne was quite well again, she thought she would like to return the Fourvilles' visit, and also to call on the Couteliers. Julien had just bought another carriage at a sale, a phaeton. It only needed one horse, so they could go out twice a month now, instead of once and they used it for the first time one bright December morning. After driving for two hours across the Normandy plains, they began to go down to a little valley, whose sloping sides were covered with trees, while the level ground at the bottom was cultivated. The ploughed fields were followed by meadows, the meadows by a fen covered with tall reeds, which waved in the wind like yellow ribbons, and then the road took a sharp turn, and the Chateau de la Vriette came in sight. It was built between a wooded slope on the one side and a large lake on the other, the water stretching from the chateau wall to the tall fir trees which covered the opposite acclivity. The carriage had to pass over an old drawbridge and under a vast Louis the Thirteenth archway before it drew up in front of a handsome building of the same period as the archway, with brick frames round the windows and slated turrets. Julien pointed out all the different beauties of the mansion to Jeanne as if he were thoroughly acquainted with every nook and corner of it. "'Isn't it a superb place?' he exclaimed. "'Just look at that archway. On the other side of the house, which looks on to the lake, there is a magnificent flight of steps leading right down to the water. Four boats are moored at the bottom of the steps, two for the comte and two for the comtesse. The lake ends down there on the right, where you can see that row of poplars, and there the river, which runs to Fécamp, arises.' The place abounds in wildfowl, and the comte passes all his time shooting. Ah, it is indeed a lordly residence. The hall door opened, and the fair-haired comtesse came to meet her visitors with a smile on her face. She wore a trailing dress like a chatelaine of the Middle Ages, and exactly suited to the place in which she lived, she looked like some beautiful lady of the lake. Four out of the eight drawing-room windows looked on to the lake and the water looked dull and dismal, overshadowed as it was by the gloomy fir-trees, which covered the opposite slope. The Comtesse took both Jeanne's hands in hers as if she had known her for ages, placed her in a seat, and then drew a low chair beside her for herself, while Julien, who regained all his old refinement during the last five months, smiled and chatted in an easy, familiar way. The Comtesse and he talked about the rides they had had together. She laughed a little at his bad horsemanship, and called him the tottering knight, and he too laughed, calling her, in return, the Amazon queen. A gun went off just under the window, and Jeanne gave a little cry. It was the comte shooting teal, and his wife called him in. There was the splash of oars, the grating of a boat against the stone steps, and then the comte came in, followed by two dogs of a reddish hue, which lay down on the carpet before the door while the water dripped from their shaggy coats. The comte seemed more at ease in his own house, and was delighted to see the vicomte and Jeanne. He ordered the fire to be made up, and Madeira and biscuits to be brought. "'Of course you will dine with us,' he exclaimed. Jeanne refused the invitation, thinking of Paul, and as he pressed her to stay, and she still persisted in her refusal, Julien made a movement of impatience. Then, afraid of arousing her husband's quarrelsome temper, she consented to stay, though the idea of not seeing Paul till the next day was torture to her. They spent a delightful afternoon. First of all, the visitors were taken to see the springs, which flowed from the foot of a moss-covered rock into a crystal basin of water, which bubbled as if it were boiling. And then they went in a boat among the dry reeds, where paths of water had been formed by cutting down the rushes. The Comte rode, his two dogs sitting each side of him with their noses in the air, and each vigorous stroke of the oars lifted the boat half out of the water and sent it rapidly on its way. Eugène let her hand trail in the water, enjoying the icy coolness which seemed to soothe her, and Julien and the Comtesse, well wrapped up in rugs, sat in smiling silence in the stern of the boat, as if they were too happy to talk. The evening drew on, and with it the icy northerly wind came over the withered reeds. 
the sun had disappeared behind the firs and it made one cold to look at the crimson sky covered with tiny red fantastically shaped clouds they all went into the big drawing-room where an enormous fire was blazing the room seemed to be filled with an atmosphere of warmth and comfort and the comte gaily took his wife in his strong arms like a child and gave her two hearty kisses on her cheek jeanne could not help smiling at this good-natured giant to whom his moustaches gave the appearance of an ogre what wrong impressions of people one forms every day she thought and almost involuntarily she glanced at julien he was standing in the doorway his eyes fixed on the comte and his face very pale his expression frightened her and going up to him she asked what is the matter are you ill there's nothing the matter with me he answered churlishly leave me alone i only feel cold dinner was announced and the comte begged permission for his dogs to come into the dining-room they came and sat one on each side of their master who every minute threw them some scrap of food the animals stretched out their heads and wagged their tails quivering with pleasure as he drew their long silky ears through his fingers after dinner when jeanne and julien began to say good-bye the comte insisted on their staying to see some fishing by torchlight they and the comtesse stood on the steps leading down to the lake while the comte got back into his boat with a servant carrying a lighted torch and a net the torch cast strange trembling reflections over the water its dancing glimmers even lighting up the firs beyond the reeds and suddenly as the boat turned round an enormous fantastic shadow was thrown on the background of the illumined wood it was the shadow of a man but the head rose above the trees and was lost against the dark sky while the feet seemed to be down in the lake this huge creature raised its arms as if it would grasp the stars the movement was a rapid one and the spectators on the steps heard a little splash the boat tacked a little and the gigantic shadow seemed to run along the wood which was lighted up as the torch moved with the boat then it was lost in the darkness then reappeared on the chateau wall smaller but more distinct and the loud voice of the comte was heard exclaiming gilbert i have caught eight the oars splashed and the enormous shadow remained standing in the same place on the wall but gradually it became thinner and shorter the head seemed to sink lower and the body to get narrower and when m de fourville came up the steps followed by the servant carrying the torch it was reduced to his exact proportions and faithfully copied all his movements in the net he had eight big fish which were still quivering as jeanne and julien were driving home well wrapped up in cloaks and rugs which the fourvilles had lent them what a good-hearted man that giant is said jeanne almost to herself yes answered julien but he makes too much show of his affection sometimes before people a week after their visit to the fourvilles they called on the coutiliers who were supposed to be the highest family in the province and whose estate lay near cany the new chateau built in the reign of louis the fourteenth lay in a magnificent park entirely surrounded by walls and the ruins of the old chateau could be seen from the higher parts of the grounds a liveried servant showed the visitors into a large handsome room in the middle of the floor an enormous sevres vase stood on a pedestal into which a crystal case had been let containing the king's autograph letter offering this gift to the marquis leopold hervé joseph germain de varneville de rolebosc de coutelier jeanne and julien were looking at this royal present when the marquis and marquise came in the latter wearing her hair powdered the marquise thought her rank constrained her to be amiable and her desire to appear condescending made her affected her husband was a big man with white hair brushed straight up all over his head and a haughtiness in his voice in all his movements in his every attitude which plainly showed the esteem in which he held himself there were people who had a strict etiquette for everything and whose feelings seemed always stilted like their words they both talked on without waiting for an answer smiled with an air of indifference and behaved as if they were accomplishing a duty imposed upon them by their superior birth in receiving the smaller nobles of the province with such politeness jeanne and julien tried to make themselves agreeable though they felt ill at ease 
and when the time came to conclude their visit, they hardly knew how to retire, though they did not want to stay any longer. However, the Marquise herself ended the visit naturally and simply, by stopping short the conversation, like a queen ending an audience. "'I don't think we will call on anyone else, unless you want to,' said Julien, as they were going back. "'The Fourvilles are quite as many friends as I want.' And Jeanne agreed with him. Dark, dreary December passed slowly away. Everyone stayed at home like the winter before, but Jeanne's thoughts were too full of Paul for her ever to feel dull. She would hold him in her arms, covering him with those passionate kisses which mothers lavish on their children, then offering the baby's face to his father. "'Why don't you kiss him?' she would say. "'You hardly seem to love him.' Julien would just touch the infant's smooth forehead with his lips, holding his body as far away as possible, as if he were afraid of the little hands touching him in their aimless movements. Then he would go quickly out of the room, almost as though the child disgusted him. The mayor, the doctor, and the curé came to dinner occasionally, and sometimes the Fourvilles, who had become very intimate with Jeanne and her husband. The comte seemed to worship Paul. He nursed the child on his knees from the time he entered Les Peuples to the time he left, sometimes holding him the whole afternoon, and it was marvellous to see how delicately and tenderly he touched him with his huge hands. He would tickle the child's nose with the ends of his long moustaches, and then suddenly cover his face with kisses, almost as passionate as Jeanne's. It was the great trouble of his life that he had no children. March was bright, dry, and almost mild. The Comtesse Gilbert again proposed that they should all four go for some rides together. And Jeanne, a little tired of the long weary evenings and the dull, monotonous days, was only too pleased at the idea, and agreed to it at once. It took her a week to make her riding habit, and then they commenced their rides. They always rode two and two, the Comtesse and Julien leading the way, and the Comte and Jeanne about a hundred feet behind. The latter couple talked easily and quietly as they rode along, for, each attracted by the other's straightforward ways and kindly heart, they had become fast friends. Julien and the Comtesse talked in whispers, alternated by noisy bursts of laughter, and looked in each other's eyes to read there the things their lips did not utter. And often they would break into a gallop, as if impelled by a desire to escape alone to some country far away. Sometimes it seemed as if something irritated Gilbert. Her sharp tones would be borne on the breeze to the ears of the couple loitering behind, and the Comte would say to Jeanne with a smile, "'I don't think my wife got out of bed the right side this morning.' One evening, as they were returning home, the Comtesse began to spur her mare, and then pull her in with sudden jerks on the rein. "'Take care, or she'll run away with you,' said Julien, two or three times. "'So much the worse for me. It's nothing to do with you,' she replied in such cold, hard tones that the clear words rang out over the fields as if they were actually floating in the air. The mare reared, kicked, and foamed at the mouth, and the comte cried out anxiously, "'Do take care of what you are doing, Gilbert!' Then, in a fit of defiance, for she was in one of those obstinate moods that will brook no word of advice, she brought her whip heavily down between the animal's ears. The mare reared, beat the air with her four legs for a moment, then, with a tremendous bound, set off over the plain at the top of her speed. First she crossed a meadow, then some ploughed fields, kicking up the wet, heavy soil behind her, and going at such a speed that in a few moments the others could hardly distinguish the comtesse from her horse. Julien stood stock still, crying, Madame! Madame! The comte gave a groan, and bending down over his powerful steed, galloped after his wife. He encouraged his steed with voice and hand, urged it on with whip and spur, and it seemed as though he carried the big animal between his legs, and raised it from the ground at every leap it took. The horse went at an inconceivable speed, keeping a straight line regardless of all obstacles, and Jeanne could see the two outlines of the husband and wife diminish and fade in the distance, till they vanished altogether, like two birds chasing each other till they are lost to sight beyond the horizon. Julien walked his horse up to his wife, murmuring angrily, 
she is mad to-day and they both went off after their friends who were hidden in a dip in the plain in about a quarter of an hour they saw them coming back and soon they came up to them the comte looking red hot and triumphant was leading his wife's horse the countess was very pale her features looked drawn and contracted and she leant on her husband's shoulder as if she were going to faint that day jeanne understood for the first time how madly the comte loved his wife all through the following month the countess was merrier than she had ever been before she came to les peuples as often as she could and she was always laughing and jumping up to kiss jeanne she seemed to have found some unknown source of happiness and her husband simply worshipped her now following her about with his eyes and seeking every pretext for touching her hand or her dress we are happier now than we have ever been before he said one evening to jeanne gilbert has never been so affectionate as she is now nothing seems to vex her or make her angry until lately i was never quite sure that she loved me but now i know she does julien had changed for the better also he had become gay and good-tempered and their friendship seemed to have brought peace and happiness to both families the spring was exceptionally warm and forward the sun cast its warm rays upon the budding trees and flowers from early morn until the sweet soft evening it was one of those favoured years when the world seems to have grown young again and nature to delight in bringing everything to life once more jeanne felt a vague excitement in the presence of this reawakening of the fields and woods she gave way to a sweet melancholy and spent hours languidly dreaming all the tender incidents of her first hours of love came back to her not that any renewal of affection for her husband stirred her heart that had been completely destroyed but the soft breeze which fanned her cheek and the sweet perfume which filled the air seemed to breathe forth a tender sigh of love which made her pulse beat quicker she liked to be alone and in the warm sunshine to enjoy these vague peaceful sensations which aroused no thoughts one morning she was lying thus half dormant when suddenly she saw in her mind that sunlit space in the little wood near etretat where for the first time she had felt thrilled by the presence of the man who loved her then where he had for the first time timidly hinted at his hopes and where she had believed that she was going to realize the radiant future of her dreams she thought she would like to make a romantic superstitious pilgrimage to the wood and she felt as if a visit to that sunny spot would in some way alter the course of her life julien had gone out at daybreak she did not know whither so she ordered the martin's little white horse which she sometimes rode to be saddled and set off it was one of those calm days when there is not a leaf nor a blade of grass stirring the wind seemed dead and everything looked as though it would remain motionless until the end of time even the insects had disappeared a burning steady heat descended from the sun in a golden mist and jeanne walked her horse along enjoying the stillness and every now and then looking up at a tiny white cloud which hung like a snowy fleece in the midst of a bright blue sky she went down into the valley leading to the sea between the two great arches which are called the gates of etretat and went slowly towards the wood the sunlight poured down through the foliage which as yet was not very thick and jeanne wandered along the little paths unable to find the spot where she had sat with julien she turned into a long alley and at the other end of it saw two saddle horses fastened to a tree she recognized them at once they were gilbert's and julien's tired of being alone and pleased at this unexpected meeting she trotted quickly up to them and when she reached the two animals which were waiting quietly as if accustomed to stand like this she called aloud there was no answer on the grass which looked as if someone had rested there lay a woman's glove and two whips julien and gilbert had evidently sat down and then gone farther on leaving the horses tied to the tree jeanne wondered what they could be doing and getting off her horse she leant against the trunk of a tree and waited for a quarter of an hour or twenty minutes 
she stood quite motionless, and two little birds flew down on to the grass close by her. One of them hopped round the other, fluttering its outstretched wings, and chirping and nodding his little head. All at once they coupled. Jeanne watched them, as surprised as if she had never known of such a thing before. Then she thought, of course, it is springtime. Then came another thought, a suspicion. She looked again at the glove, the whips, and the two horses standing riderless. Then she sprang on her horse with an intense longing to leave this place. She started back to Les Peuples at a gallop. Her brain was busy reasoning, connecting different incidents, and thinking it all out. How was it that she had never noticed anything, had never guessed this before? How was it that Julien's frequent absence from home, his renewed attention to his toilet, his better temper, had told her nothing? Now she understood Gilbert's nervous irritability, her exaggerated affection for herself, and the bliss in which she had appeared to be living lately, and which had so pleased the Comte. She pulled up her horse, for she wanted to think calmly, and the quick movement confused her ideas. After the first shock she became almost indifferent. She felt neither jealousy nor hatred, only contempt. She did not think about Julien at all, for nothing that he could do would have astonished her. But the twofold treachery of the Comtesse, who had deceived her friend as well as her husband, hurt her deeply. So everyone was treacherous and untrue and faithless. Her eyes filled with tears, for sometimes it is as bitter to see an illusion destroyed as to witness the death of a friend. She resolved to say nothing more about her discovery. Her heart would be dead to everyone but Paul and her parents, but she would bear a smiling face. When she reached home she caught up her son in her arms, carried him to her room, and pressed her lips to his face again and again, and for a whole hour she played with and caressed him. End of chapter 9, part A Chapter 9, part B of A Woman's Life by Guy de Maupassant This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Lisa Reichert Chapter 9, Part B Julien came in to dinner in a very good temper, and full of plans for his wife's pleasure. "'Won't your father and mother come and stay with us this year?' he said. Jeanne almost forgave him his infidelity, so grateful was she to him for making this proposal. She longed to see the two people she loved best after Paul, and she passed the whole evening in writing to them, and urging them to come as soon as possible." They wrote to say that they would come on the 20th of May. It was then the 7th, and Jeanne awaited their arrival with intense impatience. Besides her natural desire to see her parents, she felt it would be such a relief to have near her two honest hearts, two simple-minded beings whose life and every action, thought and desire, had always been upright and pure. She felt she stood alone in her honesty among all this guilt, she had learnt to dissimulate her feelings, to meet the Comtesse with an outstretched hand and a smiling face, but her sense of desolation increased with her contempt for her fellow-men. Every day some village scandal reached her ears, which filled her with still greater disgust and scorn for human frailty. The Couillard's daughter had just had a child, and was therefore going to be married. The Martin's servant, who was an orphan, a little girl only fifteen years old, who lived near, and a widow, a lame, poverty-stricken woman, who was so horribly dirty that she had been nicknamed La Crotte, were all pregnant, and Jeanne was continually hearing of the misconduct of some girl, some married woman with a family, or of some rich farmer who had been held in general respect. This warm spring seemed to revive the passions of mankind, as it revived the plants and the flowers. But to Jeanne, whose senses were dead, and whose wounded heart and romantic soul were alone stirred by the warm springtide breezes, and who only dreamed of the poetic side of love, these bestial desires were revolting and hateful. She was angry with Gilbert, not for having robbed her of her husband, but for having bespattered herself with this filth. 
the comtesse was not of the same class as the peasants who could not resist their brutal desires then how could she have fallen in to the same abomination the very day that her parents were to arrive julien increased his wife's disgust by telling her laughingly as though it were something quite natural and very funny that the baker having heard a noise in his oven the day before which was not baking day had gone to see what it was and instead of finding the stray cat he expected to see had surprised his wife who was certainly not putting bread into the oven the baker closed the mouth of the oven went on julien and they would have been suffocated if the baker's little boy who had seen his mother go into the oven with the blacksmith had not told the neighbors what was going on he laughed as he added that will give a nice flavor to the bread it is just like a tale of la fontaine's for some time after that jeanne could not touch bread when the post-chaise drew up before the door with the baron's smiling face looking out of the window jeanne felt fonder of her parents and more pleased to see them than she had ever been before but when she saw her mother she was overcome with surprise and grief the baroness looked ten years older than when she had left les peuples six months before her huge flabby cheeks were suffused with blood her eyes had a glazed look and she could not move a step unless she was supported on either side she drew her breath with so much difficulty that only to hear her made every one around her draw theirs painfully also the baron who had lived with her and seen her every day had not noticed the gradual change in his wife and if she had complained or said her breathing and the heavy feeling about her heart were getting worse he had answered oh no my dear you have always been like this jeanne went to her own room and cried bitterly when she had taken her parents upstairs then she went to her father and throwing herself in his arms said with her eyes still full of tears oh how changed mother is what is the matter with her do tell me what is the matter with her do you think she is changed asked the baron in surprise it must be your fancy you know i have been with her all this time and to me she seems just the same as she has always been she is not any worse your mother is in a bad way said julien to his wife that evening i don't think she's good for much now jeanne burst into tears oh good gracious went on julien irritably i don't say that she's dangerously ill you always see so much more than is meant she is changed that's all it's only natural she should begin to break up at her age in a week jeanne had got accustomed to her mother's altered appearance and thought no more about it thrusting her fears from her as people always do put aside their fears and cares with an instinctive and natural though selfish dislike of anything unpleasant the baroness unable to walk only went out for about half an hour every day when she had gone once up and down her avenue she could not move another step and asked to sit down on her seat some days she could not walk even to the end of the avenue and would say let us stop my hypertrophy is too much for me to-day she never laughed as she used to things which the year before would have sent her into fits of laughter only brought a faint smile to her lips now her eyesight was still excellent and she passed her time in reading corinne and lamartin's meditations over again and in going through her souvenir drawer she would empty on her knees the old letters which were so dear to her heart place the drawer on a chair beside her look slowly over each relic and then put it back into its place when she was quite alone she kissed some of the letters as she might have kissed the hair of some loved one who was dead jeanne coming into the room suddenly sometimes found her in tears what is the matter mamma dear she would ask my souvenirs have upset me the baroness would answer with a long-drawn sigh they bring to my mind so vividly the happy times which are all over now and make me think of people whom i had almost forgotten i seem to see them to hear their voices and it makes me sad you will feel the same later on if the baron came in and found them talking like this he would say 
jeanne my dear if you take my advice you will burn all your letters those from your mother mine every one's there is nothing more painful than to stir up the memories of one's youth when one is old but jeanne who had inherited her mother's sentimental instincts though she differed from her in nearly everything else carefully kept all her old letters to form a souvenir box for her old age also a few days after his arrival business called the baron away again the baroness soon began to get better and jeanne forgetting julien's infidelity and gilbert's treachery was almost perfectly happy the weather was splendid mild starlit nights followed the soft evenings and dazzling sunrises commenced the glorious days the fields were covered with bright sweet-smelling flowers and the vast calm sea glittered in the sun from morning till night one afternoon jeanne went into the fields with paul in her arms she felt an exquisite gladness as she looked now at her son now at the flowery hedgerows and every minute she pressed her baby closely to her and kissed him the earth exhaled a faint perfume and as she walked along she felt as though her happiness were too great for her then she thought of her child's future what would he be sometimes she hoped he would become a great and famous man sometimes she felt she would rather he remained with her passing his life in tender devotion to his mother and unknown to the world when she listened to the promptings of her mother's heart she wished him to remain simply her adored son but when she listened to her reason and her pride she hoped he would make a name and become something of importance in the world she sat down at the edge of a ditch and studied the child's face as if she had never really looked at it before it seemed so strange to think that this little baby would grow up and walk with manly strides that these soft cheeks would become bearded and the feeble murmur changed to a deep-toned voice someone called her and looking up she saw marius running towards her thinking he had come to announce some visitor she got up feeling vexed at being disturbed the boy was running as fast as his legs could carry him madame he cried when he was near enough to be heard madame la baronne is very ill jeanne ran quickly towards the house feeling as if a douche of cold water had been poured down her spine there was quite a little crowd standing under the plane tree which opened to let her through as she rushed forward there in the midst lay the baroness on the ground her head supported by two pillows her face black her eyes closed and her chest which for the last twenty years had heaved so tumultuously motionless the child's nurse was standing there she took him from his mother's arms and carried him away how did it happen what made her fall asked jeanne looking up with haggard eyes send for the doctor immediately as she turned she saw the cure he at once offered his services and turning up his sleeves began to rub the baroness with eau de cologne and vinegar but she showed no signs of returning consciousness she ought to be undressed and put to bed said the priest and with his aid joseph couillard old simon and ludivine tried to raise the baroness as they lifted her her head fell backwards and her dress which they were grasping gave way under the dead weight of her huge body they were obliged to lay her down again and jeanne shrieked with horror at last an armchair was brought from the drawing-room the baroness was placed in it carried slowly indoors then upstairs and laid on the bed the cook was undressing her as best she could when the widow dantou came in as if like the priest she had smelt death as the servants said joseph couillard hurried off for the doctor and the priest was going to fetch the holy oil when the nurse whispered in his ear you needn't trouble to go monsieur le cure i have seen too much of death not to know that she is gone jeanne in desperation begged them to tell her what she could do what remedies they had better apply the cure thought that anyhow he might pronounce an absolution and for two hours they watched beside the lifeless livid body jeanne unable to contain her grief sobbing aloud as she knelt beside the bed when the door opened to admit the doctor 
she thought that with him came safety and consolation and hope and she rushed to meet him trying to tell him in a voice broken with sobs all the details of the catastrophe she was walking like she does every day and she seemed quite well better even than usual she had eaten some soup and two eggs for lunch and quite suddenly without any warning she fell and turned black like she is now she has not moved since and we have tried everything to restore her to consciousness everything she stopped abruptly for she saw the nurse making a sign to the doctor to intimate that it was all over then she refused to understand the gesture and went on anxiously is it anything serious do you think there is any danger he answered at last i very much fear that that life is extinct be brave and try to bear up for an answer jeanne opened her arms and threw herself on her mother's body julien came in he made no sign of grief or pity but stood looking simply vexed he had been taken too much by surprise to at once assume an expression of sorrow i expected it he whispered i knew she could not live long he drew out his handkerchief wiped his eyes knelt down and crossed himself as he mumbled something then rose and attempted to raise his wife she was clinging to the corpse almost lying on it as she passionately kissed it they had to drag her away for she was nearly mad with grief and she was not allowed to go back for an hour then every shadow of hope had vanished and the room had been arranged fittingly for its dead occupant the day was drawing to a close and julien and the priest were standing near one of the windows talking in whispers the widow dentu thoroughly accustomed to death was already comfortably dozing in an armchair. The curé went to meet Jeanne as she came into the room, and taking both her hands in his, he exhorted her to be brave under this sorrow, and attempted to comfort her with the consolation of religion. Then he spoke of her dead mother's good life, and offered to pass the night in prayers beside the body. But Jeanne refused this offer, as well as she could for her tears she wanted to be alone quite alone with her mother this last night that cannot be interposed julien we will watch beside her together she shook her head unable to speak for some moments then she said she was my mother and i want to watch beside her alone let her do as she wants whispered the doctor the nurse can stay in the next room and julien and the priest thinking of their night's rest gave in the abbe picot knelt down prayed for a few moments then rose and went out of the room saying she was a saintly woman in the same tone as he always said dominus vobiscum won't you have some dinner asked the vicomte in a perfectly ordinary voice jeanne not thinking he was speaking to her made no answer you would feel much better if you would eat something he went on again let someone go for papa directly she said as if she had not heard what he said and he went out of the room to dispatch a mounted messenger to rouen jeanne sank into a sort of stupor as if she were waiting to give way to her passion of regret until she should be alone with her mother the room became filled with shadows the widow dan too moved noiselessly about arranging everything for the night and at last lighted two candles which she placed at the head of the bed on a small table covered with a white cloth jeanne seemed unconscious of everything she was waiting until she should be alone when he had dined julien came upstairs again and asked for the second time won't you have something to eat his wife shook her head and he sat down looking more resigned than sad and did not say anything more they all three sat apart from one another the nurse dropped off to sleep every now and then, snored for a little while, then awoke with a start. After some time, Julien rose and went over to his wife. "'Do you still want to be left alone?' he asked. She eagerly took his hand in hers. "'Oh, yes, do leave me,' she answered. He kissed her on the forehead, whispered, "'I shall come and see you during the night,' then went away with the widow Dentu, who wheeled her armchair into the next room." jeanne closed the door and put both windows wide open a warm breeze laden with the sweet smell of hay blew into the room and on the lawn which had been mown the day before she could see the heaps of dry grass lying in the moonlight she turned away from the window and went back to the bed 
for the soft, beautiful night seemed to mock her grief. Her mother was no longer swollen as she had been when she died. She looked simply asleep. Only her sleep was more peaceful than it had ever been before. The wind made the candles flicker, and the changing shadows made the dead face look as though it moved and lived again. As Jeanne gazed at it, the memories of her early childhood came crowding into her mind. She could see again her mother sitting in the convent parlour, holding out the bag of cakes she had brought for her little girl. She thought of all her little ways, her affectionate words, the way she used to move, the wrinkles that came round her eyes when she laughed, the deep sigh she always heaved when she sat down, and all her little daily habits, and as she stood gazing at the dead body, she kept repeating almost mechanically, She is dead, she is dead, until at last she realized all the horror of that word. The woman who was lying there, Mamma, little mother, Madame Adelaide, was dead. She would never move, never speak, never laugh, never say, Good morning, Jeannette, never sit opposite her husband at the dinner table again. She was dead. She would be enclosed in a coffin, placed beneath the ground, and that would be the end. They would never see her again. It could not be possible. What? She, her daughter, had now no mother. Had she indeed lost for ever this dear face, the first she had ever looked upon, the first she had ever loved, this kindly loving mother, whose place in her heart could never be filled, and in a few hours even this still unconscious face would have vanished, and then there would be nothing left her but a memory. She fell on her knees in despair, wringing her hands and pressing her lips to the bed. Oh, mother, mother, my darling mother! she cried in a broken voice which was stifled by the bed covering. She felt she was going mad, mad like the night she had fled into the snow. She rushed to the window to breathe the fresh air which had not passed over the corpse or the bed on which it lay. The new-mown hay, the trees, the wasteland, and the distant sea lay peacefully sleeping in the moonlight, and the tears welled up into Jeanne's eyes as she looked out into the clear, calm night. She went back to her seat by the bedside and held her mother's dead hand in hers, as if she were lying ill instead of dead. Attracted by the lighted candles, a big, winged insect had entered through the open window and was flying about the room, dashing against the wall at every moment with a faint thud. It disturbed Jeanne, and she looked up to see where it was, but she could only see its shadow moving over the white ceiling. Its buzzing suddenly ceased, and then, besides the regular ticking of the clock, Jeanne noticed another, fainter, rustling noise. It was the ticking of her mother's watch, which had been forgotten when her dress had been taken off and thrown at the foot of the bed. And the idea of this little piece of mechanism, still moving, while her mother lay dead, sent a fresh pang of anguish through her heart. She looked at the time. It was hardly half-past ten, and as she thought of the long night to come, she was seized with a horrible dread. She began to think of her own life, of Rosalie, of Gilberte, of all her illusions, which had been, one by one, so cruelly destroyed. Life contained nothing but misery and pain, misfortune and death. There was nothing true, nothing honest, nothing but what gave rise to suffering and tears. Repose and happiness could only be expected in another existence, when the soul had been delivered from its early trials. Her thoughts turned to the unfathomable mystery of the soul, but as she reasoned about it, her poetic theories were invariably upset by others, just as poetic and just as unreal. Where was now her mother's soul, the soul which had forsaken this still cold body? Perhaps it was far away, floating in space, but had it entirely vanished like the perfume from a withered flower? Or was it wandering like some invisible bird freed from its cage? Had it returned to God, or was it scattered among the new germs of creation? It might be very near, perhaps in this very room, hovering around the inanimate body it had left, and at this thought Jeanne fancied she felt a breath, as if a spirit had passed by her. Her blood ran cold with terror. She did not dare turn round to look behind her. 
and she sat motionless, her heart beating wildly. At that moment the invisible insect again commenced its buzzing, noisy flight, and Jeanne trembled from head to foot at the sound. Then as she recognized the noise she felt a little reassured, and rose and looked around. Her eyes fell on the escritoire with the sphinx's heads, the guardian of the souvenirs. As she looked at it she thought it would be fulfilling a sacred filial duty which would please her mother as she looked down on her from another world, as she might have done a holy book during this last watch. She knew it was the correspondence of her grandfather and grandmother whom she had never known, and it seemed as if her hands would join theirs across her mother's corpse, and so a sacred chain of affection would be formed. Between those who had died so long ago, their daughter who had but just joined them, and her child who was still on earth. She opened the escritoire and took out the letters. They had been carefully tied into ten little packets which were laid side by side in the lowest drawer. A refinement of sentimentality prompted her to place them all on the bed in the baroness's arms. Then she began to read. They were old-fashioned letters with the perfume of another century about them, such as are treasured up in every family. The first commenced, My dearie, another, My little darling. Then came some, beginning, My pet, My beloved daughter, then, My dear child, My dear Adelaide, My dear daughter. The commencements varying, as the letters had been addressed to the child, the young girl, and later on to the young wife. They were all full of foolish, loving phrases, and news about a thousand insignificant homely events, which to a stranger would have seemed too trivial to mention. Father has an influenza. Hortense has burnt her finger. Crocorat the cat is dead. The fir tree which stood on the right-hand side of the gate has been cut down. Mother lost her mass-book as she was coming home from church. She thinks someone must have stolen it and they talked about people whom Jeanne had never known, but whose names were vaguely familiar to her. She was touched by these simple details which seemed to reveal all her mother's life and inmost thoughts to her. She looked at the corpse as it lay there, and suddenly she began to read the letters aloud, as though to console and gladden the dead heart once more, and a smile of happiness seemed to light up the face. As she finished reading them, Jeanne threw the letters at the foot of the bed, resolving to place them all in her mother's coffin. She untied another packet. These were in another handwriting, and the first ran thus. I cannot live without your kisses. I love you madly. There was nothing more, not even a signature. Jeanne turned the paper over, unable to understand it. It was addressed clearly enough to Madame Le Baron Le Pertuis des Vaudes. She opened the next. Come to-night, as soon as he has gone out. We shall have at least one hour together. I adore you. A third. I have passed a night of longing and anguish. I fancied you in my arms, your mouth quivering beneath mine, your eyes looking into my eyes, and then I could have dashed myself from the window as I thought that, at that very moment, you were sleeping beside him, at the mercy of his caresses. Jeanne stopped in amazement. What did it all mean? To whom were these words of love addressed? She read on, finding in every letter the same distracted phrases, the same assignations, the same cautions, and at the end always the five words, Above all, burn this letter. At last she came to an ordinary note, merely accepting an invitation to dinner. It was signed, Paul Denemar. Why, that was the man of whom the baron still spoke as poor old Paul, and whose wife had been the baroness's dearest friend. Then into Jeanne's mind came a suspicion which at once changed to a certainty. He had been her mother's lover. With a sudden gesture of loathing, she threw from her all these odious letters, as she would have shaken off some venomous reptile, and running to the window, she wept bitterly. All her strength seemed to have left her. She sank on the ground, and, hiding her face in the curtains to stifle her moans, she sobbed in an agony of despair. 
she would have crouched there the whole night if the sound of someone moving in the next room had not made her start to her feet. Perhaps it was her father, and all these letters were lying on the bed and on the floor. He had only to come in and open one, and he would know all. She seized all the old yellow papers, her grandparents' epistles, the love letters, those she had not unfolded, those that were still lying in the drawer, and threw them all into the fireplace. Then she took one of the candles which were burning on the little table, and set fire to this heap of paper. A bright flame sprang up at once, lighting up the room, the bed, and the corpse with a bright flickering light, and casting on the white bed curtain a dark trembling shadow of the rigid face and huge body. When there was nothing left but a heap of ashes in the bottom of the grate, Jeanne went and sat by the window, as though now she dare not sit by the corpse. The tears streamed from her eyes, and hiding her face in her hands, she moaned out in heartbroken tones, "'Oh, poor mamma, poor mamma. Then a terrible thought came to her. Suppose her mother, by some strange chance, was not dead. Suppose she was only in a trance-like sleep, and should suddenly rise and speak. Would not the knowledge of this horrible secret lessen her, Jeanne's, love for her mother? Would she be able to kiss her with the same respect, and regard her with the same esteem as before? No, she knew it would be impossible, and the thought almost broke her heart. The night wore on, the stars were fading, and a cool breeze sprang up. The moon was slowly sinking towards the sea, over which she was shedding her silver light and the memory of that other night she had passed at the window, the night of her return from the convent, came back to Jeanne. Ah, oh, how far away was that happy time! How changed everything was! And what a different future lay before her from what she had pictured then! Over the sky crept a faint, tender tinge of pink, and the brilliant dawn seemed strange and unnatural to her, as she wondered how such glorious sunrises could illumine a world in which there was no joy or happiness. A slight sound startled her, and looking round she saw Julien. "'Well, are you not very tired?' he said. "'No,' she answered, feeling glad that her lonely vigil had come to an end. "'Now go and rest,' said her husband. She pressed a long sorrowful kiss on her mother's face, then left the room. That day passed in attending to those melancholy duties that always surrounded death. The baron came in the evening, and cried a great deal over his wife. The next day the funeral took place. Jeanne pressed her lips to the clammy forehead for the last time, drew the sheet once more over the still face, saw the coffin fastened down, and then went to await the people who were to attend the funeral. Gilberte arrived first, and threw herself into Jeanne's arms, sobbing violently. The carriages began to drive up, and voices were heard in the hall. The room gradually filled with women with whom Jeanne was not acquainted. Then the Marquise de Coutillier and the Vicomtesse de Briseville arrived, and went up to her and kissed her. She suddenly perceived that Aunt Lisson was in the room, and she gave her such an affectionate embrace that the old maid was nearly overcome. Julien came in dressed in deep mourning. He seemed very busy and very pleased that all these people had come. He whispered some question to his wife about the arrangements, and added in a low tone, "'It will be a very grand funeral. All the best families are here.' Then he went away again, bowing to the ladies as he passed down the room. Aunt Lisson and the Comtesse Gilberte stayed with Jeanne while the burial was taking place. The Comtesse repeatedly kissed her, murmuring, "'Poor darling, poor darling!' And when the Comte de Fourville came to take his wife home, he wept as if he had lost his own mother. End of Chapter 9, Part B Chapter 10, Part A of A Woman's Life by Guy de Montpassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Lisa Reichert. Chapter 10, Part A. The next few days were very sad, as they always must be directly after a death. The absence of the familiar face from its accustomed place makes the house seem empty, 
and each time the eye falls on anything the dear dead one has had in constant use a fresh pang of sorrow darts through the heart there is the empty chair the umbrella still standing in the hall the glass which the maid has not yet washed in every room there is something lying just as it was left for the last time the scissors an odd glove the fingered book the numberless other objects which insignificant in themselves become a source of sharp pain because they recall so vividly the loved one who has passed away and the voice rings in one's ears till it seems almost a reality but there is no escape from the house haunted by this presence for others are suffering also and all must stay and suffer with each other in addition to her natural grief jeanne had to bear the pain of her discovery she was always thinking of it and the terrible secret increased her former sense of desolation tenfold for now she felt that she could never put her trust or confidence in any one again the baron soon went away thinking to find relief from the grief which was deadening all his faculties in change of air and change of scene and the household at les peuples resumed its quiet regular life again then paul fell ill and jeanne passed twelve days in an agony of fear unable to sleep and scarcely touching food the boy got well but there remained the thought that he might die what should she do if he did what would become of her gradually there came a vague longing for another child and soon she could think of nothing else she had always fancied she should like two children a boy and a girl and the idea of having a daughter haunted her but since rosalie had been sent away she had lived quite apart from her husband and at the present moment it seemed utterly impossible to renew their former relations julien's affections were centred elsewhere she knew that and on her side the mere thought of having to submit to his caresses again made her shudder with disgust still she would have overcome her repugnance so tormented was she by the desire of another child if she could have seen any way to bring about the intimacy she desired but she would have died rather than let her husband guess what was in her thoughts and he never seemed to dream of approaching her now perhaps she would have given up the idea had not each night the vision of a daughter playing with paul under the plane tree appeared to her sometimes she felt she must get up and join her husband in his room twice in fact she did glide to his door but each time she came back without having turned the handle her face burning with shame the baron was away her mother was dead and she had no one to whom she could confide this delicate secret she made up her mind at last to tell the abbe picot her difficulty under the seal of confession she went to him one day and found him in his little garden reading his breviary among the fruit trees she talked to him for a few minutes about one thing and another then monsieur l'abbe i want to confess she said with a deep blush he put on his spectacles to look at her better for the request astonished him i don't think you can have any very heavy sins on your conscience he said with a smile no but i want to ask your advice on a subject so so painful to enter upon that i dare not talk about it in an ordinary way she replied feeling very confused he put on his priestly air immediately very well my daughter come to the confessional and i will hear you there but she suddenly felt a scruple at talking of such things in the quietness of an empty church no monsieur le cure after all if you will let me i can tell you here what i want to say see we will go and sit in your little arbour over there as they walked slowly over to the arbour she tried to find the words in which she could best begin her confidence they sat down and she commenced as if she were confessing my father then hesitated said again my father then stopped altogether too ashamed to continue the priest crossed his hands over his stomach and waited for her to go on well my daughter he said perceiving her embarrassment you seem afraid to say what it is come now be brave my father i want to have another child 
she said abruptly, like a coward throwing himself headlong into the danger he dreads. The priest, hardly understanding what she meant, made no answer, and she tried to explain herself, but in her confusion her words became more and more difficult to understand. I am quite alone in life now. My father and my husband do not agree. My mother is dead, and, and the other day I almost lost my son, she whispered with a shudder. What would have become of me if he had died? The priest looked at her in bewilderment. There, there, come to the point, he said. I want to have another child, she repeated. The abbé was used to the coarse pleasantries of the peasants, who did not mind what they said before him, and he answered with a sly smile and a knowing shake of the head, "'Well, I don't think there need be much difficulty about that.' She raised her clear eyes to his and said hesitatingly, "'But, but you don't understand that since, since that trouble with the maid, my husband and I, my husband and I live quite apart.' These words came as a revelation to the priest, accustomed as he was to the promiscuity and easy morals of the peasants. Then he thought he could guess what the young wife really wanted, and he looked at her out of the corner of his eye, pitying her and sympathizing with her distress. "'Yes, yes, I know exactly what you mean. I can quite understand that you should find your, your widowhood hard to bear. You are young healthy, and it is only natural, very natural. He began to smile, his lively nature getting the better of him. Besides, the church allows these feelings sometimes, he went on, gently tapping Jeanne's hands. What are we told? That carnal desires may be satisfied lawfully in wedlock only. Well, you are married, are you not? She, in turn, had not at first understood what his words implied. But when his meaning dawned on her, her face became crimson, and her eyes filled with tears. "'Oh, Monsieur le Curé, what do you mean? What do you think? I assure you, I assure—' And she could not continue for her sobs. Her emotion surprised the abbé, and he tried to console her. "'There, there,' he said. "'I did not mean to pain you. I was only joking.' and there's no harm in a joke between honest people. But leave it all in my hands. I will speak to Monsieur Julien. She did not know what to say. She wished now that she could refuse his help, for she feared his want of tact would only increase her difficulties. But she did not dare say anything. Thank you, Monsieur le Curé, she stammered, and then hurried away. The next week was passed by Jeanne in an agony of doubts and fears. Then, one evening, Julien watched her all through dinner with an amused smile on his lips, and evinced towards her a gallantry which was faintly tinged with irony. After dinner they walked up and down the Baroness's avenue, and he whispered in her ear, "'Then we are going to be friends again?' She made no answer, and kept her eyes fixed on the ground, where there was a straight line, hardly so thickly covered with grass as the rest of the path. It was the line traced by the baroness's foot, which was gradually being effaced, just as her memory was fading, and, as she looked at it, Jeanne's heart felt bursting with grief. She seemed so lonely, so separated from everybody. "'For my part, I am only too pleased,' continued Julien. "'I should have proposed it before, but I was afraid of displeasing you.' The sun was setting. It was a mild, soft evening and Jeanne longed to rest her head on some loving heart, and there sob out her sorrows. She threw herself into Julien's arms, her breast heaving, and the tears streaming from her eyes. He looked at her in surprise, thinking this outburst was occasioned by the love she still felt for him, and unable to see her face, he dropped a condescending kiss upon her hair. Then they went indoors in silence, and he followed her to her room. To him this renewal of their former relations was a duty, though hardly an unpleasant one, while she submitted to his embraces as a disgusting, painful necessity, and resolved to put an end to them for ever, as soon as her object was accomplished. Soon, however, she found that her husband's caresses were not like they used to be. 
they may have been more refined they certainly were not so complete he treated her like a careful lover instead of being an easy husband why do you not give yourself up to me as you used to do she whispered one night her lips close to his to keep you out of the family way of course he answered with a chuckle she started don't you wish for any more children then she asked his amazement was so great that for a moment he was silent then eh what do you say he exclaimed are you in your right senses another child i should think not indeed we've already got one too many squalling and costing money and bothering everybody another child no thank you she clasped him in her arms pressing her lips to his and murmured oh i entreat you make me a mother once more don't be so foolish he replied angrily pray don't let me hear any more of this nonsense she said no more but she resolved to trick him into giving her the happiness she desired she tried to prolong her kisses and threw her arms passionately around him pressing him to her and pretending a delirium of love she was very far from feeling she tried every means to make him lose control over himself but she never once succeeded tormented more and more by her desire driven to extremities and ready to do or dare anything to gain her ends she went again to the abbe picot she found him just finishing lunch with his face crimson from indigestion and anxious to hear the result of his mediation well he exclaimed my husband does not want any more children she answered at once without any of the hesitation or shamefaced timidity she had known before the abbe got very interested and turned towards her ready to hear once more of those secrets of wedded life the revelation of which made the task of confessing so pleasant to him how is that he asked in spite of her determination to tell him all jeanne hardly knew how to explain herself he he refuses to make me a mother the priest understood at once it was not the first time he had heard of such things but he asked for all the details and enjoyed them as a hungry man would a feast when he had heard all he reflected for a few moments then said in a calm matter-of-fact tone he might have used if he had been speaking of the best way to ensure a good harvest my dear child the only thing you can do is to make your husband believe you are pregnant then he will cease his precautions and you will become so in reality jeanne blushed to the roots of her hair but determined to be ready for every emergency she argued but but suppose he should not believe me the cure knew too well the ins and outs of human nature not to have an answer for that tell everybody you are enceinte when he sees that every one else believes it he will soon believe it himself you will be doing no wrong he added to quiet his conscience of advising this deception the church does not permit any connection between man and woman except for the purpose of procreation jeanne followed the priest's artful advice and a fortnight later told julian she thought she was enceinte he started up it isn't possible it can't be she gave him her reasons for thinking so bah he answered you wait a little while every morning he asked well but she always replied no not yet i am very much mistaken if i am not enceinte he also began to think so and his surprise was only equalled by his annoyance well i can't understand it was all he could say i'll be hanged if i know how it can have happened at the end of a month she began to tell people the news but she said nothing about it to the comtesse gilberte for she felt an old feeling of delicacy in mentioning it to her at the very first suspicion of his wife's pregnancy julien had ceased to touch her then angrily thinking well at any rate this brat wasn't wanted he made up his mind to make the best of it and recommenced his visits to his wife's room everything happened as the priest had predicted and jeanne found she would a second time become a mother then in a transport of joy she took a vow of eternal chastity as a token of her rapturous gratitude to the distant divinity she adored 
and thenceforth closed her door to her husband. She again felt almost happy. She could hardly believe that it was barely two months since her mother had died, and that only such a short time before she had thought herself inconsolable. Now her wounded heart was nearly healed, and her grief had disappeared, while in its place was merely a vague melancholy, like the shadow of a great sorrow resting over her life. It seemed impossible that any other catastrophe could happen now. Her children would grow up and surround her old age with their affection, and her husband could go his way while she went hers. Towards the end of September, the Abbe Picot came to the chateau, in a new cassock which had only one week's stains upon it, to introduce his successor, the Abbe Tolbiac. The latter was small, thin, and very young, with hollow, black-encircled eyes, which betokened the depth and violence of his feelings, and a decisive way of speaking as if there could be no appeal from his opinion. The Abbe Picot had been appointed Doyen of Gauderville. Jeanne felt very sad at the thought of his departure. He was connected in her thoughts with all the chief events of her life, for he had married her, christened Paul, and buried the Baroness. She liked him because he was always good-tempered and unaffected, and she could not imagine Etuvan without the Abbe Picot's fat figure trotting past the farms. He himself did not seem very rejoiced at his advancement. "'I have been here eighteen years, Madame la Comtesse,' he said, "'and it grieves me to go to another place. Oh, this living is not worth much, I know, and as for the people, well, the men have no more religion than they ought to have. The women are not so moral as they might be, and the girls never dream of being married until it is too late for them to wear a wreath of orange blossoms. Still, I love the place.' The new curé had been fidgeting impatiently during this speech, and his face had turned very red. "'I shall soon have all that changed,' he said abruptly, as soon as the other priest had finished speaking, and he looked like an angry child in his worn but spotless cassock, so thin and small was he. The Abbé Picot looked at him sideways, as he always did when anything amused him. "'Listen, l'abbé,' he said. You will have to chain up your parishioners if you want to prevent that sort of thing, and I don't believe even that would be any good. We shall see, answered the little priest in a cutting tone. The old curé smiled and slowly took a pinch of snuff. Age and experience will alter your views, l'abbé. If they don't, you will only estrange the few good churchmen you have. When I see a girl come to Mass with a waist bigger than it ought to be, I say to myself, well, she is going to give me another soul to look after, and I try to marry her. You can't prevent them going wrong, but you can find out the father of the child and prevent him forsaking the mother. Marry them, l'abbé, marry them, and don't trouble yourself about anything else. We will not argue on this point, for we should never agree, answered the new curé a little roughly, and the abbé Picot again began to express his regret at leaving the village and the sea which he could see from the vicarage windows, and the little funnel-shaped valleys where he went to read his breviary, and where he could see the boats in the distance. Then the two priests rose to go, and the Abbé Picot kissed Jeanne, who nearly cried when she said good-bye. A week afterwards the Abbé Tolbiac called again. He spoke of the reforms he was bringing about as if he were a prince taking possession of his kingdom. He begged the Vicomtesse to communicate on all the days appointed by the church, and to attend Mass regularly on Sundays. "'You and I are at the head of the parish,' he said, "'and we ought to rule it, and always set it a good example. But if we wish to have any influence, we must be united. If the church and the chateau support each other, the cottage will fear and obey us.' Jeanne's religion was simply a matter of sentiment. She had merely the dreamy faith that a woman never quite loses, and if she performed any religious duties at all, it was only because she had been so used to them at the convent. For the baron's carping philosophy had long ago overthrown all her convictions. The Abbé Picot had always been contented with the little she did do, and never chid her about not confessing or attending Mass oftener. But when the Abbé Tolbiac did not see her at church on the Sunday, he hastened to the chateau to question and reprimand her. She did not wish to quarrel with the curé, 
so she promised to be more attentive to the services, inwardly resolving to go regularly only for a few weeks, out of good nature. Little by little, however, she fell into the habit of frequenting the church, and in a short time she was entirely under the influence of the delicate-looking, strong-willed priest. His zeal and enthusiasm appealed to her love of everything pertaining to mysticism, and he seemed to make the chord of religious poetry, which she possessed in common with every woman, vibrate within her. His austerity, his contempt for every luxury and sensuality, his disdain for the things that usually occupy the thoughts of men, his love of God, his youthful, intolerant inexperience, his scathing words, his inflexible will, made Jeanne compare him, in her mind, to the early martyrs, and she, who had already suffered so much, whose eyes had been so rudely opened to the deceptions of life, let herself be completely ruled by the rigid fanaticism of this boy, who was the minister of heaven. He led her to the feet of Christ the Consoler, teaching her how the holy joys of religion could alleviate all her sorrows, and as she knelt in the confessional, she humbled herself and felt little and weak before this priest, who looked about fifteen years old. Soon he was detested by the whole countryside. With no pity for his own weaknesses, he showed a violent intolerance for those of others. The thing above all others that roused his anger and indignation was love. He denounced it from the pulpit in crude ecclesiastical terms, thundering out terrible judgments against concupiscence over the heads of his rustic audience and as the pictures he portrayed in his fury persistently haunted his mind, he trembled with rage and stamped his foot in anger. The grown-up girls and the young fellows cast sidelong glances at each other across the aisle, and the old peasants, who liked to joke about such matters, expressed their disapproval of the little cure's intolerance as they walked back to their farms after service with their wives and sons. The whole country was in an uproar, the priest's severity and the harsh penances he inflicted at confession were rumoured about, and as he obstinately refused to grant absolution to the girls, whose chastity was not immaculate, smiles accompanied the whispers. When, at the holy festivals, several of the youths and girls stayed in their seats instead of going to communicate with the others, most of the congregation laughed outright as they looked at them, he began to watch for lovers like a keeper on the lookout for poachers, and on moonlight nights he hunted up the couples along the ditches, behind the barns and among the long grass on the hillsides. One night he came upon two who did not cease their love-making even before him. They were strolling along a ditch filled with stones, with their arms round one another, kissing each other while they walked. "'Will you stop that, you vagabonds?' cried the abbé. "'You mind your own business, Monsieur le Curé,' replied the lad, turning round. "'This ain't nothing to do with you.' The abbé picked up some stones and threw them at the couple, as he might have done at stray dogs, and they both ran off laughing. The next Sunday the priest mentioned them by name before the whole congregation. All the young fellows soon ceased to attend Mass. The Curé dined at the chateau every Thursday but he very often went there on other days to talk to his penitente. Jeanne became as ardent and as enthusiastic as he, as she discussed the mysteries of a future existence, and grew familiar with all the old and complicated arguments employed in religious controversy. They would both walk along the Baroness's avenue, talking of Christ and the Apostles, of the Virgin Mary, and of the Fathers of the Church, as if they had really known them. Sometimes they stopped their walk to ask each other profound questions, and then Jen would wander off into sentimental arguments, and the curé would reason like a lawyer possessed with a mania of proving the possibility of squaring the circle. Julien treated the new curé with great respect. "'That's the sort of a priest I like,' he was continually saying. "'Half measures don't do for him.' And he zealously set a good example by frequently confessing and communicating. Hardly a day passed now without the vicomte going to the Fourvilles, either to shoot with the comte, who could not do without him, or to ride with the comtesse, regardless of rain and bad weather. 
they are riding mad remarked the comte but the exercise does my wife good end of chapter ten part a